The Rules Committee will uh, come to order. We are here for consideration of H.R. 2, the Jobs and Growth Tax Act of 2003. And uh, let me just say at the outset, there's been uh, a great deal of uh, debate and discussion on this measure, and I know we're going to uh, have a full discussion here this evening. And uh, we have, uh, I think, 19 witnesses who are scheduled to appear before us, and then we will look forward to uh, reporting out a measure which uh, I know will allow for uh, an opportunity for a free-flowing debate on this question on the floor tomorrow. And so let me welcome our two very distinguished witnesses, the Chairman of the Committee on Ways and Means Committee, my fellow Californian, Mr. Thomas, and our good friend from New York, Mr. Rangel, the ranking minority member of the Ways and Means Committee. And gentlemen, let me say as you uh, prepare your uh, if you have any prepared statements, they will, without objection, appear in their entirety in the record, and we will uh, welcome a summary from you. Yes, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Frost. Uh, if it's appropriate, uh, I have an opening statement. Please proceed. Slide. Mr. Chairman, I am hopeful that this will be a productive hearing because this nation faces a serious economic challenge right now. The American people are still suffering from the third Republican recession in the past 20 years and the second Bush recession in a little more than a decade. Some 2.7 million American jobs have been lost since President Bush took office, and record surpluses have turned into dangerous deficits, deficits that Alan Greenspan fears will threaten long-term economic growth. This is the dismal economic record of two and a half years of Republican policies, and it comes despite what Republicans said was a great economic success, the package of tax breaks they passed in 2001. So I'm disappointed and quite frankly a bit perplexed that the bill that the majority reported out of the Ways and Means Committee offers little more than the same old failed economic policies, budget-busting tax breaks for the wealthiest few. America has tried Republican economic policy, and we have seen the results, the worst record of job creation since Herbert Hoover. I don't know why you insist on making the American people suffer anymore. So I hope, Mr. Chairman, that this committee will provide a rule that will offer to the will offer the Democratic substitute the procedural protections it needs in order to be considered on the floor. If the Republican majority allows us to offer our Democratic jobs and growth package, which differs substantially uh, from the Ways and Means Republican tax package, the House can vote on a fiscally responsible and fast-acting economic surplus stimulus plan that provides tax relief to working families and one that will immediately create jobs and create one million new jobs this year. It's time this Congress gets off the failed economic path of the past two and a half years and starts doing something that will actually create jobs, put Americans back to work, and provide sustainable economic growth that will benefit all Americans, not just provide massive tax relief to the wealthiest Americans. Unfortunately, the benefits of the tax package the Republican majority has brought to us today does not provide much relief at all to the working men and women I represent and won't provide much relief to the 8.8 .8 million Americans who are now counted among the unemployed. The Democratic package provides immediate stimulus to the economy, is fully paid for, unlike the Republican package, and is fair to all Americans. I wish I could say the same of the package Chairman Thomas brings to us this evening. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the debate in the committee today and on the floor tomorrow. I am sure my Republican friends will say that Democrats are raising taxes and spending money money that I would submit helps the economy right now and will help the millions of Americans who have lost their jobs since President Bush took office. But anyone with even a little bit of sense will recognize that Republicans are proposing to spend borrowed money that will force future Congresses to tax at ever higher rates to stem the red ink of this Congress's own making. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Frost. I sense there might be a little disagreement on this issue uh, here in the uh, committee, but uh, we'll proceed now with uh, Mr. Chairman, our testimony. Mr. Are we McGovern. Allowed, I, I think we have some opening statements as well. We'd like to. Well, we have 19 witnesses. If you'd like to offer an opening well, statement, we, please we, we proceed. Mr. McGovern. Is, we think this bill is important enough that we shouldn't just rush through it. We should talk about it. And I want to thank the. Well, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure, and, and um, I want. I appreciate the chairman's uh, courtesy and allowing me to, to deliver a brief statement. And, uh, and first, let me say, and I want to echo the words of uh, our ranking uh, member, Mr. Frost, that I hope that we on this side of the aisle will be allowed a meaningful substitute. And I hope that on an issue that this important, uh, with such critical implications for the nation's future, that we would be granted the same courtesies 
the leadership bill gets on waivers of points of order. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this bill before us today, in, in my opinion, is, is, is simply the wrong bill uh, at the wrong time. The leadership's tax package is too expensive. It helps the wrong people. It, fail, it will fail to stimulate the economy, and it continues to leave states and local communities on the brink of disaster. And it uses gimmicks to obscure its real costs. Two years ago, this House approved more than a trillion dollar tax cut, mostly for the wealthy. We were told that the bill would stimulate the economy, create jobs, do everything but cure the common cold. Instead, our economy continues to stagnate. April was the third straight month that the American economy lost jobs. 8.8 .8 million people are unemployed. 4.4 million more have, been, have given up look, even looking. Industrial production fell again in March. States are facing their worst fiscal crisis since World War II. And the deficit, which Republicans used to care about, has exploded, which will lead to higher long-term interest rates and a legacy of debt left to our children. And the Republicans' response to this mess is more tax cuts uh, for the very richest in our country, more of the same failed policy. Not only that, the few tax cuts in the plan that do benefit the middle class only last a couple of years. Only the capital gains and dividend tax cuts last the entire 10 years. Either the Republicans believe that only businesses and not working families should be able to plan for the future, or they are trying to hide the real long-term cost of this bill. Either way, it's wrong. Uh, and I've got to say that this plan isn't win win winning many converts out there in the real world. When I speak before groups in my district, even traditionally Republican or groups, uh, they're worried about the deficit. They're worried about the health of states and local communities, worried about cops and firefighters and teachers being laid off, worried about the unemployment rate. Um, they aren't clamoring for a tax cut uh, in the dividend tax rate. Uh, there are moments, Mr. Chairman, when I feel that people here in Washington are really out of touch with the rest of the country. Uh, and this is one of those moments. Uh, rather than listen to the coalition of big business groups that the White House has threatened to support this, uh, this bill, uh, we should listen to our governors and our mayors. Uh, we should listen to independent economists, local business owners, and people on the front lines of our economy. What people are clamoring for, quite frankly, is an aid package to, to help our states and our cities and our local communities deal uh, with the current fiscal crisis. Uh, and this, this bill doesn't speak for them. The American people are hurting, and they deserve a better bill, and I hope that they will ultimately get one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield my, my time. Mr. Chairman, I have a very brief statement as well. Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The question, in my judgment, is can we afford this tax cut? While fighting a war on terrorism, while the national debt continues to grow, while federal mandates go unfunded, while Medicare and Medicaid are in fiscal trouble, and while states uh, suffer a fiscal crisis, um, it's not a good thing uh, that we do here uh, today. The proposed tax cuts are, in my judgment, not responsible at a time of mounting deficits and difficult demands on government. Unless the measure stimulates demand in the short term, it won't give the unemployed jobs. And if the Reagan years taught us anything, and I would argue they probably didn't, but if they did, isn't it that trickle-down economics doesn't work. This tax cut plan is completely out of touch with the economic reality in America. Who would pay for President Bush's big tax cuts? The poor, the children, the elderly, the people counting on a prescription drug of, of reform, Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, or the states and municipalities. People in this country are hurting. They're afraid of losing their jobs or not finding one. That is not to mention the 8.8 .8 million that have already lost their jobs and some who are probably never to be employed again. They're worried about not being able to pay for heat or put food on the table, but instead we're up here debating tax cuts by cuts in programs, paid for by cuts in programs for the needy. This measure will burden future generations, and because of the majority's tax cut plan, our children, in my judgment, will suffer from a massive 
federal debt. H.R. 2 is nearsighted, unproductive, and in the final analysis, selfish. It doesn't have to be this way. By substituting the majority's reckless tax cuts with a real economic growth plan, we can and rightly should be fiscally responsible. America needs an economic plan that focuses on providing relief to the hardest hit families. I believe that such a plan uh, can uh, be fashioned by those of us uh, on both sides of the aisle uh, uh, that appro approach this sensibly. We face grave uncertainties. We can't even grasp uh, the challenges of tomorrow. This Congress, in my judgment, must act responsibly and not shortchange our children's future. I urge the President and the Republican leadership to take Chairman Greenspan's advice and not crush any hope of a vigorous economic recovery by creating a mountain of debt that leaves us hard pressed to meet the needs of this and future generations. And I thank the chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Hastings. It looks as if Mrs. Slaughter just might have an opening statement. And if so, I'd love to recognize her. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. I, it's very kind considering that I missed my time. Thank you no, very much for your graciousness. Your appreciate it. Uh, the American economy is suffering, and certainly the American people are suffering. The unemployment level rose, rose last month to 6%, and almost 9 million Americans are unemployed. In New, in New York, the unemployment rate is 6.3. The number of people who are employed is dropping at a daily rate. Federal unemployment benefits that expire at the end of May will create more havoc for people and for various economies. According to this study by economy.com, each dollar spent on unemployment programs benefits the economy by 1.73 cents. <clears throat> Excuse me, a dollar and 73 cents. In contrast, reducing the taxation of dividends only returns nine cents. Now, yesterday, the committee considered legislation that did nothing to create jobs. And today, we will again create legislation that does not do anything to create jobs. This tax proposal, as Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha, said, doesn't change the amount of money paid to the federal government. It merely changes who pays. Lowering the tax rate on income derived from capital gains or dividends unfairly benefits the wealthiest of Americans who need the relief much less than the single mother working as a waitress or the father who teaches junior high English. In fact, the vast majority of the people in my district, the 28th in New York, would receive no tax relief under the capital gains and dividend tax cut proposals. 78% of the people there would not benefit from the reduction in capital gains tax. 71% would not benefit from the reduction of dividend taxes. Again, as we said to you many times, this tax package is too heavily skewed toward the wealthiest taxpayers. Just last week, Alan Greenspan told the House Financial Services Committee that the economy was poised to grow without further large tax cuts and that budget deficits resulting from lower taxes without offsetting reductions in spending would indeed damage the economy. Americans need help right now. April was the third straight month that this economy lost jobs. The number of jobs right now is at its lowest point in 41 months. This body should be considering a short-term stimulus package putting people back to work right now. H.R. 2 is the wrong bill at the wrong time. Remember that Franklin Roosevelt showed us the way with WPA and construction jobs and infrastructure work that really put people back to work and brought this country out of the worst depression it has seen so far. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mrs. Slaughter. And uh, there seems to be a strong sense on the uh, minority side that uh, is not terribly supportive of the uh, Jobs and Growth Tax Act that we have. And I'd like to now call on Mr. Linder, uh, who will um, offer a I just uh, have a brief comment, Mr. Brief Chairman. Comment. And it was occasioned by the comments made by my friend from Florida about Reagan's trickle-down economics. Facts are stubborn things, that has been said. In 1980, the revenues to the Treasury were $519 billion. In 1990, they were $1,054,000,000. billion. That didn't come from government creating jobs. It became because our neighbors created 4 million new businesses and 20 million new jobs. And they increased their contributions to the Treasury by double. They increased their contributions to strangers 
people they've never met from 48 billion in 1980 to 100 billion in 1990. This was not a generation of greed. This was a genera the American generation, I think, in the American century. And to continually refer to that in disparaging terms and deprecating terms is just simply wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let, me, let me just say that uh, we have 19 witnesses, and um, we've had opening statements. And let's proceed with hearing from the chairman of the Committee on Appropriations and the ranking minority member of the committee. Excuse me. <laughs> Well, actually, that slip may not have been too far from uh, the truth, actually, based on one of the proposals we're going to be getting. But uh, I'm happy to recognize the, uh, the chairman of the Committee on Ways and Means, Mr. Thomas. And as I said, your prepared remarks will, without objection, appear in the record. Thank you. And I won't paraphrase or uh, refer back to um, my prepared remarks. Uh, they actually uh, were designed to address the bill that's before us. Um, I am constantly amazed at the wisdom of those who've gone before us. I often wondered why uh, the Rules Committee was constituted of so few members. And uh, this evening, I'm pleased uh, that that is the case. I understand that the gentleman from Texas urged that the minority substitute be provided with procedural protections. I'm here to ask you not to provide the majority's bill with any procedural protections because they don't need any. This bill was written according to the budget resolution that we are supposed to be operating under. As a matter of fact, what I can give you is all of the documentation prepared by the Joint Committee on Taxation in structuring this bill to make sure that it fits within the budget rules. So we ask that no rules be waived. If, in fact, that means that the minority is asking for a special privilege, that their bill can't fit the budget resolution and therefore needs procedural protections, I could certainly understand why. Because I don't have anything here today to provide you of an analysis nature of the substitute they're going to offer. Unfortunately, their bill was introduced the day after the committee marked up legislation. What it has backing it are banners and banters and political statements. What we have are professional staff's analysis of the bill that we're presenting today. Also, factually wrong statements have been made about the bill. The statement that this bill does nothing about jobs is simply wrong. If, in fact, we want to encourage that father or mother that the gentlewoman from New York indicated needed help now, HR2 provides over the next three years $600 more than the proposal that the Democrats are going to offer you. If they've asked us to produce a stimulus bill, our bill in assisting those with children is front-loaded. That's one of the key definitions of a stimulus. They have a bill that runs through almost the rest of the decade in that regard. Money spent in 08 and 09 doesn't solve the problem that we face today. But most importantly, the point that I want to address in the short time I have is that there is a total misconception on the part of some of our friends on the other side of the aisle because perhaps they don't understand that this bill was written cognizant of statute already on the book. That is, in a very difficult process, we were able to, on the margin, attempt to help stimulate and grow the economy in 2001. Had we had more cooperation from our friends on the other side of the aisle, we would have built a much better bill as had passed the House. But in order to make law, we made a number of concessions which stretched out portions of that 2001 bill. I find it ironic now, when we did it to meet the complaints of Democrats, they now use that as a criticism against what we've done in the past. It may be ironic, but it's certainly not new. For example, on the modification of the rates, we would have wished to have accelerated the changes and made them active in 2001. 
We were denied that in conference, and all we could achieve was that the rates between 2001 and 2006 be phased in. They're now complaining that that help isn't available. But the primary concern that I, I have about some of the comments made was that since they were going to be phased in in 06 for the rest of the decade, all we really need to do is phase them in between now and 06, and you have a structure that's there for the rest of the decade, because this bill was written and designed to be complementary to statutes that are already on the books, not some new cooked up gimmick that may not be able to make, meet the rules unless you provide procedural protections that the Democrats with banners and banters introduced yesterday. The other comment, nothing about jobs. Frankly, nothing could be further from the truth because what we've done is improved upon the president's desire to create jobs. What we've done is created an opportunity not just for those businesses to find a small business, but all businesses, an opportunity to invest over the next two years and gain a significant advantage in that investment on depreciable assets of less than 20 years. In addition to that, we said that leasehold build-outs would qualify for that 20 years. What's a leasehold build-out? Has anyone gone by a strip mall uh, near their home and noticed that one of those um, buildings or storefronts has changed hands? Sometimes they go from cleaners to restaurants uh, or to now one of the fashions I've noticed is for the finishing of women's nails and that sort of thing. Those buildings tend to be, to a degree, um, topical and they need to change every two to three to four to five years. The owner of that facility expending the money to change it, to shift it from a nail shop to a cleaner or to a restaurant, has to depreciate that expense over 39 and a half years. What we're saying is you can now do 50% of it right away. That means more people will be converting places, which the answer is that's jobs first question someone would ask is, well, yeah, you have the ability to do that, but if you don't have the capital, you can't, precisely. That's why we also include in the bill a change in current law. Currently, we say for two years, you can take any losses that you have today and, and, and stretch them over profits over the last two years. The last two years doesn't get you into the decade of the 90s where there were significant profits, as has been indicated by our friends in their opening statements. If we can reach back to the previous administration when there were profits and allow people to cast their loss off today against those profits, then they would be able to bring cash today to invest in those changes we've provided for them. We have a five-year net operating loss carryback. Those provisions, along with the capital gains uh, and the dividends, has been estimated to produce in 04 alone, 850,000 jobs, and the calendar year 03 and 04, 1.2 million jobs. We produce over 03 and 04, $200 billion in the hands of Americans, not just to do the growth in jobs, but to sustain the consumer demand. There is no bill that this House will consider that has a greater impact in 03 and 04 than this bill. There is no bill that will generate greater growth in the underlying structures than this bill. If you're interested in a stimulus, HR2 is the product. If you're interested in jobs, HR2 is the product. If you're interested in growth, HR2 is the product. How in the world could we be all things to all people which the substitute admits it isn't? It's very simple. We spend more money. We invest in the economy for all those reasons under the budget resolution, $550 billion. In fact, in the first two years, we invest more in the economy than the entire bill that the Democrats are going to offer. If you really want stimulus and not just an argument, if you really want jobs and not just political statements, and if you really want growth, which no American should be opposed, then the only choice you have is to vote for H.R. 2 because their bill is either deficient 
or vacant on all of those areas as I just described. And I thank the chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Rangel, please turn well, your please turn your microphone on. We'd love to hear. I um, thank you so much. Uh, it's very interesting listening uh, to the chairman explain this bill, and he's so committed to its worth that I do hope that uh, he would join with me in persuading this committee to allow us to have a uh, substitute to weigh points of order. If he says that he's just he hasn't seen the bill or that uh, uh, or he hasn't had a chance to comment on it, he is correct. I was only trying to act like the chairman because all the things he's telling you today, it came to the committee for the first time on Tuesday. And that's when the bill was marked up. It would have been the right thing, in my opinion, if Democrats and Republicans got together and where we couldn't agree, they draft their bill subject to amendment and we draft our bill. But that didn't happen and it never happens. The way it works in our committee is that when the chairman gets the votes, the bill comes out. Now, I don't object to that because this would not be the right forum for me to do it. And if he's convinced that a tax cut to go to the wealthiest Americans is going to create jobs or less than capital gains tax cuts, uh, taxes, or reducing or eliminate dividend taxes on dividends are going to create uh, uh, this, not giving assistance to the states, uh, borrowing money uh, in order to have tax cuts. Hey, that's what we're in Congress for, to say that's his opinion, that may be his party's opinion, but Democrats, even though we're in a minority, we should have a right and an opportunity to express our opinion. To listen to Mr. Thomas, you would think that waiving points of orders was a communist conspiracy in order for Democrats to overthrow the government. I mean, that's what we do, wave points of order, you know? And I learned how to do it from Mr. Thomas. And so you're not supposed to change the rules just because you got the vote. You're supposed to be proud of your product. You're supposed to go on the floor and I am thoroughly convinced that this would help Republicans just as much as Democrats, because most of the Republicans didn't have the slightest clue what we were marking up. It's just that, let's get it over with. And it didn't take us much time, because it wasn't much to debate. And so what I'm asking is that we have some ideas. Sure, it doesn't cost much money, because there was a strange feeling on our side that we shouldn't go into debt and that we should pay for it. Sure, you can ridicule it as uh, raising taxes because we do fr fr freeze the uh, uh, top two brackets. But there's one thing that we do that we hope that even though it may not fit in the four corners of what the rules would allow, is that we try to give some assistance to those people who are without jobs, many without hope, that really, in our opinion, we think would stimulate the economy. So we do a lot of things, but I can tell you this, that as you heard the members of this committee feeling compelled to express themselves on this bill, uh, I am asked many times to go to the Democratic caucus and ask, well, what's going to be up and what are the rules and what chance are we going to have? Well, members worked hard on the substitute, and they really think and I had reason to believe that they were going to be hurried on the substitute. If a substitute is going to be offered without the privilege of having a waiver, then it would appear to the Democrats in the House that we won't have an opportunity to be hurried. Now, you know and I know that you have the votes to kill the substitute, and you have the votes to pass your tax cut bill. But you also have an opportunity to make it at least appear to be fair and equitable to give us a chance to express ourselves. Let me make it abundantly clear. If we don't get the rule, we do believe
believe that we owe it to our constituents to express ourselves, to let it be known that we had a different idea and that we wanted and we begged and we asked the Republican majority to give us an opportunity to waive any relevant points of order to present our case to the floor. Now, anything short of that, it would appear to me that you're not afraid that we're going to win. You're not afraid that we're going to defeat you. You just don't want us to be hurried at all. And if that's the case, I don't intend to argue with you at this meeting. It's abundantly clear that uh, in the middle of the night, President Bush bill was introduced on a Friday night after most of us have left the Capitol. And on Monday sometime, Mr. Thomas introduced his bill. And then this chairman's mark was introduced on Tuesday morning. And on Tuesday afternoon, you have the product that's before you without any amendments. We're hoping that you give us a chance just to say that we think we have a better idea, even though the political situation being what it is, we don't expect to succeed with the votes. If, on the other hand, you believe that your document is so weak that we might get Republican votes, then I can better understand not getting the rule we requested. But thank you for giving me this opportunity. And I thank the chairman for uh, explaining that. Waiving points of order it depends on who has the Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Rangel. We appreciate Can I clarify your testimony. My position let, let, me, let me just, you're, you're going to have a chance my to clarify. Ranking member may, may I just, didn't Mr. Mr. Me. Chairman, may I just sure. proceed? Thank you. Let me just say that um, we uh, appreciate the fact that both of you have uh, offered very uh, helpful and interesting testimony here. And I would first say to Mr. Rangel, obviously, uh, you are being heard. I mean, there is no doubt about the fact that there is a great deal of discussion. I saw your press conference last night when you unveiled your package, and so uh, there is clearly an opportunity for this to be discussed. But I think that this this committee this committee has you're this committee. I, I should take my case to television. No, I mean you're being heard. I mean you're being heard right now. You're uh, being no, heard right now before this rules committee. And no, you're I made a mistake. Say, I was talking say, about it in the House of Representatives, but if you suggest, well, I know you've been talking about this, show. and and uh, clearly as we proceed with this rule, you'll have an opportunity to discuss that. But let me just say that um, this committee has the responsibility to make a uh, determination uh, procedurally as to how we uh, move ahead with this very important legislation. Now, Mr. Thomas, you. Um, indicated in your opening uh, statement that you um, did not want uh, protection of points of order to be raised against the bill. I just want to, um, the letter the letter that came to our committee, in fact, uh, requested that there be a waiver of all points of order. I understand, because I thought we were going to operate under normal rules. But what mm -hmm. I heard from the minority was, and I wouldn't go so far as to say it's a threat, because I've heard much better threats, so I don't think it really equaled that that either they can't or they wouldn't be able to write a bill that went through the scrutiny of the committee, because it didn't. Whatever Mr. Rangel says about timing, our bill was looked at by the bipartisan professional staff, presented in committee, amendments were offered, and the committee acted. That mm -hmm. cannot be said about his bill. Mm -hmm. So either they couldn't or they wouldn't scrut allow it to be scrutinized by the Committee of Jurisdiction. They're now coming before you and saying they couldn't or they wouldn't write a bill under the budget rules and that you have to waive all the rules or their work product would not be able to be made in order on the floor. Well, it's, not just, it's was, not just the budget rules. We also have concern about the rules and the other body that have to be addressed. All I and said, there are a number Mr. Chairman, here. was I'm prepared mm -hmm. to bring the bill that has been reviewed by the bipartisan staff, voted on in committee, and go to the floor without any waiving of the rules because we wrote a piece of legislation mm -hmm. that fits the rules. Mm -hmm. And we went through the committee. And what I heard was that unless you waive the rules, and mm -hmm. because they wrote a bill that couldn't stand being scrutinized in committee, they want you to provide something beyond the ability to, to, to have a contest on equal footing. Mm -hmm. 
They need crutches, support, and they argue they won't stay to debate their bill if you don't give them special privileges. That's the only point I wanted to make. And we I don't need special privileges. We've gone through committee. They, have, they can't meet the special privileges argument without your help, and they never went through committee. Let me just say That's that all. I have gone through uh, the package that you have there. You have an, an outline uh, here, uh, Mr. Rangel, and it is clear that there are uh, a number of non-germane items here. Waivers of the Budget Act are requested, which clearly go far beyond anything that would be conceivable in the committee reported package. Correct. And that's why uh, I just wanted to have clarified, because, Mr. Thomas, in the letter that you did send to me, your request was that a waiver of all points of order against the committee reported bill be made, and uh, Mr. Frost has just raised that issue with me. And Mr. Chairman, you'll find the letter I wrote you today is the same letter I've written right. every time right. we've come before the committee. You asked for an committee. appropriate rule, I know. Every and this, time. All this... I heard was a thinly veiled threat that they won't, they'll walk out mm -hmm. if they don't get all points of order waived, mm -hmm. a bill that never would have been germane in committee and never right. was presented in committee because it couldn't have stand, it couldn't have stood the scrutiny of committee. I just want people to understand what they're asking for. They want special treatment mm -hmm. or they'll walk out. Mm -hmm. Now, if the committee sees fit to give them special treatment so they can present a bill on the floor, which would otherwise be in violation of the rules, which ours is not, then that's the decision of this committee. All I said was, I'm prepared to go to the floor without my request, with no waivers. The only problem is, I can meet that test. They can't. Mm -hmm. And the committee decision is yours, And let, let me just say uh, to, to Mr. Rangel, as we look at the... Uh, issues that are non-germane. Clearly, uh, I mean, w what would be uh, your sense of moving to the floor with your uh, package, which would not include those items which would violate the Budget Act, the Bird Rule, and other rules of the House that would be non-germane? I'm trying to bring some equity to clearly was an unfair way in which this bill was brought to our committee. The whole idea that uh, that on a Friday, we will be notified that on a mm -hmm. Tuesday, a Thursday or Friday, that we'll be marking up the bill. And for the first time we see the bill, it's on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And so the chairman is just amazed that we were not able to take our bill through the scrutiny of the full committee. Mm -hmm. Well, his bill only had a couple of hours of scrutiny because no one had seen it before. And so it, it was possible, remote as it may seem, that his bill may have met the needs of the Democrats. So why would we have to think about having a substitute? But when you keep a bill... Well, I do notice that a number of the, the items closet. that you got in your substitute are actually items that are included in the committee reported bill as it relates to small business. And so I think that... I think that, I think that Mr. Thomas has also said, Mr. These... Rangel, that as you look at the proposal that he proceeded with here, uh, we, in fact, saw the majority comply with the rules of the House in reporting the measure out of the committee. Chairman, and as he pointed out, I am trying uh, you to didn't. say to you that if you blindside it with the major bill, the chairman's markup, how in God's name would we have the opportunity to bring our substitute when we have no clue as to what's in the major bill or what is in the so-called chairman's mark. Mr. Thomas. All I'm saying is because of the unfairness in which the committee was treating, treated, that I'm asking the rules committee to try to compensate that Thank for you. for that and giving us a chance to be heard. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I'm kind of amazed, based upon the impassioned statements made by the minority, that they didn't have some idea of what they wanted, and that they could have been able to construct an alternative, which is what a substitute is, an alternative based upon what they wanted. If the gentleman is now telling me that the minority is incapable of putting a bill together until they see ours, I'm, I'm frankly amazed. Because what happened was, they were able to roll out a product on Wednesday the next day. Not under the scrutiny of the committee, but with banners and bunting in a sales promotion. And yet they were able to do that the very next day. I find it ironic that they don't know what they want until they see our product, but they now feel very passionately about theirs. Thank you very much. I'm going to call on Mr. F uh, Goss now, and uh, I'll be back in just a couple minutes. 
Thank you. Uh, since uh, the chairman has been called away momentarily, I will proceed with the order, Mr. Frost. Uh, Ms. Thomas, I just want to be clear on one thing, because I think I understand what you just said to the chairman, but I just want to be clear. Yeah. Um, the, the chairman, Chairman Dreyer, cited your letter dated May 8th, in which um, you asked for uh, you asked the committee to waive all points of order. Are you withdrawing that request? No, that's the standard letter I offer. However, based upon the statements that you made and the statements of the ranking member, I'm more than willing to amend the standard letter that I provide. Well, I just want to know what you're more view than is. willing to do that. If I, the gentleman I, wishes to have a gentleman's agreement that no points of order are waived then I'm more than willing to accept that as the ground rules well, going to the floor. Is the gentleman willing Mr. to Mr. accept Mr. Tom, that? Mr. Thomas, uh, I heard you give your opening statement in which you said you were not requesting waivers. And then Mr. Dreyer and I determined that, in fact, you'd signed a letter in which you were requesting waivers. So my, I'm just my trying to decide. My opening statement said nothing about waiving the rules. I quoted you saying you wanted procedural protections. I said I was willing not to have those based upon your statement. I, I, Mr. What I'm you just, have just trying is to determine what you're asking this committee to do, whether you want us to give you protections or not give you protections. If you don't want protections, uh, and if the committee then comes forward with a rule uh, uh, that w gives you those protections, I certainly am going to impose, uh, oppose that based on your statement to this committee that you don't want them and don't need them. I just want to be clear on this. What the I think you ought to think seriously about is equal treatment. Well, I am willing, let me make the statement. I am willing to live with whatever decision you make. If you don't want to waive the rules on both bills, I accept that. If you want to waive the rules on both bills, I accept that. As far as I'm concerned, I don't care which one you choose. What I heard from you and the ranking member was, you'll stage some kind of a dramatic political walkout if you don't get waivers because your bill won't be able to meet the second test. That is, no waivers. I just wanted you to yeah, know that. Thomas, and I, I wanted everyone to know that unless you get special treatment, you are not able to offer a bill because you didn't build one under the rules we're supposed to follow. If you don't want to follow the rules, fine. I'm able to follow the rules because we built a bill under the rules. Makes no difference to me. Waive the rules, don't waive the rules. You need to have the rules waived. I don't. That's the only point I wanted to make. I think I understand that. My concern is if this committee, if the Rules Committee then presents a rule, after having heard you make that statement, if the Rules Committee then presents a rule for us to vote on that does exactly what you said you don't want, if they present us a rule waiving points of order against your bill, but not waiving points of order against Mr. Rangel's substitute, that will be a real problem. And I intend to point that out at the time. I, I understand exactly what you're saying is that you don't want, uh, you don't want uh, points of order waived against each bill, either bill. Didn't say that. I thought I said, I, I, I don't I care said you whether didn't the want committee. Of order no, waived listen against carefully, bill, Mr. Mr. Frost. Thomas, I, I, think I, I don't care you. whether you waive the bills or don't waive the, the rules. Waive them, don't waive them. Treat them both the same. Well, that's my point. And Treat what I'm telling you is I don't need to have the rules waived. If you don't want to waive the rules, that's fine with me. Is it fine with you? M Mr. Thomas, um, you know, I'm just, I just want to make sure I understand. And the witnesses don't ask the questions. If I recall the procedure, the uh, members of the committee ask the questions. But, Mr. Thomas, I just want to be clear. You don't choose to answer. That's fine. I, I just want to be clear that if your friends on the Republican side on the Rules Committee bring forward a rule that is contrary to what you have just testified you, you think should be the case, that I certainly intend to oppose that rule. And uh, uh, the, the majority members of the Rules Committee routinely waive points of order for the majority. Now, you said you don't need those waivers. And I hope the majority members are listening to what you said, because uh, that we'll have a real problem. If Abby, you said you don't need waivers, and then they bring something waiving, giving you waivers, but not giving Mr. Rangel waivers. I think we're clear on this subject. Oh, I agree with you on that. The Good. two bills should not clear. be treated differently. I think we are they clear. They should be treated the same. And I will be very, and I anxiously await the rule that the majority will present, because I have a, a suspicion that it will not be as you have just indicated. And I don't care which is chosen by you folks. You cannot waive the rules or waive yeah, the rules. I, I, think, I think I'm clear on this. 
I think and, we have clarity. Equal I, treatment is good. I do have a substantive Mr. Linder? question. I do have one ah, substantive question, me. if Mr. I may. Mr. Frost. Because after all, we do have a bill, tax bill before us, and would like to ask you about one provision in that mm -hmm. bill, which I find rather interesting. It's the provision dealing with the dividends and capital gains section of your bill. Now, if I understand correctly, there's something called the 515 provision that would reduce tax rates on dividends and capital gains to 5% for taxpayers in the lowest bracket, and brackets plural, and to 15% for all other taxpayers. So if I understand correctly, um, we're changing the tax treatment of, uh, of dividends. We're now lumping them in with capital gains. It's an interesting proposal and certainly is, mer is worthy of discussion. I do recall when I was, uh, when I first started getting dividends, which was many years ago, small dividends, I do recall that there was a dividend exclusion of $100 or $200. I don't remember the exact was $200. $200. We used, to have, a, we used to have a dividend exclusion. Uh, we, I don't remember when we did away with that. But 1986 tax bill. So. Um, are, you, are you proposing that this, uh, this new uh, treatment of dividends be capped in any way? Are you saying that this lower tax rate on dividends uh, should only apply to a certain amount of dividends or would it apply to any amount of dividends? Any amount of dividends. Okay, so if uh, if someone's getting a million dollars or two million dollars worth of dividends, they would uh, uh, they would get this uh, this new lower rate. Not the five percent. That applies only to the ten uh, and the fifteen percent. Yeah, currently, bracket. dividends are taxed at their whatever their marginal rate is. That's correct. And if their marginal rate is thirty nine percent or thirty five percent, whatever it is. Well, it's thirty eight point six at the highest rate now, so it couldn't be thirty nine. Th thirty eight point six. Excuse me for rounding off. Uh, so if their marginal rate is 38.6 right now, uh -huh. their million dollars worth of dividends would be taxed at 38.6, and under your provision, their million dollars worth of dividends would be taxed at 15 percent. So this would be something like a 60 percent reduction. And all those folks at 40,000 will be taxed at 5 percent, oh, and there are I'm millions more at that dollar amount. Oh, I understand there are a lot more people who get those smaller amounts of dividends, but the total amount of money the aggregate amount of money is greater for those folks getting the large amount of dividends. They make well, we understand there's a difference in philosophy here. Um, if you wanted to help the people, those mom and pop, uh, those uh, people uh, saving for their retirement, if you wanted to help them with their dividends, why, don't you, why didn't you return just to a dividend exclusion up to a certain amount the way we used to have under previous law? Why didn't, then a 200 was pretty low, quite frankly. Why didn't you just have a $1,000 exclusion or a $500 exclusion? Uh, that way you'd take care of all those folks in the $40,000 bracket. Uh, at first glance, it sounds rather appealing, but if you do an analysis in any depth, you'll find out that to the degree you exclude from income Income, which is exactly what you just said you would do because dividends are asking. income, you then begin to affect the amount that would be subject to the payroll tax and to the HI tax. Your proposal would exclude income that would otherwise pay into Medicare and Social well, Security. Chairman, uh, if, I, I, if I could finish my sure, statement. Then I have a question because I'm, I'm curious about what you just said. I'm interested yes. in not diminishing funds going into the Social Security Trust Fund and the Medicare Trust Fund. Your proposal would do that. Ours does not. Now, Mr. Chairman, I, I do receive not a great amount of dividend income, but I receive a little dividend income. And I don't recall that there's any withholding from my dividend income that I get right now from my. Uh, uh, from, uh, I don't recall that there's any Medicare withholding or that there's any Social Security withholding from the dividends that I get right now. Is it, am I not remembering correctly? Uh, if the gentleman does his own taxes, he knows that he places the amount of income on the page. You then add up all the income, your W-2 form, your dividends, other sources of income you then have it applied to your taxes. If you're going to introduce an exclusion, you have removed the amount that you're now going to pay. You effect a change in your total income, which does affect the amount that goes into trust funds. Well, maybe I misunderstood. And, the, and the problem is, the higher the income you have, the more you're able to exclude, as the gentleman very well pointed out, which means it has a greater impact on the trust funds than would otherwise well, be the case. Maybe I misunderstood the gentleman, but I thought I heard him say withholding. 
And there's no, no. withholding if I get, uh, I get $15 worth of dividends. Uh, uh, there's no withholding on that. No, the income. That. If, in fact, I said withholding, well, I then I... Worth of dividends. That's, I don't that was, if I said withholding, that. that was a misstatement on my part. It is a change in your total income which affects what you pay because you exclude a portion of your income by doing an exclusion, as you suggested. But I don't, I don't think you should exclude a portion of income, especially of richer people. I think they should be subjected to those taxes, not protected. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm just trying to understand, because this is complicated, and there are a lot of people who may be listening to this or watching this and thinking that they, they get their little dividend check, and they, like me, they don't see any withholding on their little dividend check that they get. Um, and uh, if I remember the tax law correctly, and I do uh, personally review my returns, I don't prepare my returns, but I personally review them and talk to my CPA about them, uh, I don't recall that at any point there is any, with, there is any uh, Social Security or Medicare taxes taken from unearned income, which are dividends. I recall that it only comes from earned income. Now, am I, am I not remembering correctly? I think you'll find that if you'll sit down and I have more than willing to sit down with the tax attorneys and the staff that we utilize, there is an interactive impact which negatively affects the trust funds. That's an interesting proposition, and I guess uh, you and I just have different recollections of how, uh, how our forms are filled out and what happens when we fill out our that's forms, fine. and that's a discussion that we can continue later. Uh, Ms. Thomas, uh, it's always a pleasure to have you before this committee. Um, it is very, your testimony is interesting, um, and I intend to uh, attempt to enforce uh, your request to this committee that the majority and the minority be treated exactly the same way in the rule, and I appreciate your testimony. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Frost. I, I was about to say I would hope we could keep some of the commentary on the purpose of the meeting, which is the rule. I realize it's fascinating uh, for uh, everybody here and the listening public to discuss uh, withholding and matters like that. And I, I do pay quarterly, and I pay my estimates. And uh, if you're asking me about my dividends, yes, I pay them. And if my dividends don't come through, then the government got money they shouldn't have had. Well, you and so I do pay out of time. Mr. Chairman, because uh, I have paid quarterly from time to time, your quarterly payments, of course, are an anticipated income taxes, they don't, they're not on, uh, on Social Security and Medicare. But they are nevertheless questions of paying on income, which uh, has not yet necessarily materialized. Oh, I understand that, but, well, but I, know, just, there is no quarterly Just answering your point, your Mr. Social Frost. Social Security and your Medicare. I, again, I don't think the American public is, is interested in this kind of detail. Everybody has to struggle with their own taxes. I hope everybody's paying the law, though, and paying their estimated quarterly taxes. <laughs> Mr. Linder. Mr. Chairman, I hope I don't vouchsafe a secret here, but Mr. Frost is going to vote against this rule irrespective of what it says. If I could respond, uh, that's not true. If Mr. Uh, if Mr. Rangel is granted the uh, the waiver so that he can present his, then we, uh, then we could uh, his have alternative, done, I, I would support this rule then enthusiastically. We could have done under, I might vote against the bill, we possibly could have but done I certainly would support UC the rule. And then save C-SPAN all this attention. Mr. Uh, Rangel, um, your bill provides for $27 billion for unemployment benefits. Um, 18 billion for Medicaid assistance to the states, 26 billion for infrastructure. Why didn't you bring your bill through the appropriations process instead of the Ways and Means Committee? Because uh, we were informed that it was supposed to be a stimulus package to create jobs and to, uh, uh, to get uh, consumers uh, active uh, in buying. And so what we wanted was a bill that coincided with what the Republicans was bringing up uh, not what, not just one that would encourage economic growth, but one that would be paid for and avoid the deficit. And it's, and it's your and it's your belief that twenty seven billion dollars spent for people who are not working is a good way to create job growth. Well, we have every reason to believe that that money will be going directly into the uh, the economy. Yes, Mr. Chairman, do your, does your bill larded with spending measures? Well, we're not able to write a bill. Uh, such as the one that the minority is offering that in would substitute, under the rules. because under the rules we wouldn't be capable of doing it. And we thought we would write a bill which was in the jurisdiction of the Ways and Means Committee 
come before the Rules Committee as the Ways and Means Committee and offer a bill. I didn't know it was a freelance operation regardless of the rules and regardless of the committee jurisdiction and then demand that you make the bill in order or we'll walk out. I'd, if that was the game, we obviously may have approached it slightly differently, but I understand that that's the way they want to play it. All I'm saying is, if you treat me equally, I'm more than willing to meet them halfway. Thank you. But obviously, they wrote a bill which doesn't meet us halfway because they put things in it we couldn't. May I say, <laughs> Mr. Linder, uh, for the record, that I have attended no meeting with any Democrats on the committee or off of the committee that suggested that Democrats intended to walk out. Now, four times Mr. Thomas has said that, but uh, I guarantee you he has not one scintilla bit of evidence, rumor or fact, to present to this committee for that. Well, you also and as it relates are you also prepared to guarantee that you're not going to walk out? I do, I'm not in the business of guaranteeing Mr. Thomas anything unless, of course, there's some reciprocity uh, that's involved here, but he doesn't guarantee me that I'm going to be treated fairly as it relates to a tax bill. The only thing I did say and want to emphasize is that our position will be heard, and we hope that you give us an opportunity to do it on the floor. But this, this feeling about the uh, waving points of order is something that's repugnant to the Ways and Means Committee. I, 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 I just challenge when he found out that he didn't need this type of protection for our bills. I thought we'd never have a bill uh, without one. Now, this is the first time in my 33 years that the Ways and Means Committee chairman is saying, hey, we don't need that protection. And I assume he's prepared to give you guarantees that he'll be doing that with every bill he brings here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Gentlemen, I know that all of us serving in Congress, as well as the people of the country, are concerned about the growing deficit. And in that regard, I would like to ask each of you uh, how these tax bills are paid for, or are they not paid for? Uh, if the money's going to be borrowed, could you please give us some estimate of what you think the debt service might be for the life of this bill? Let me say I find the question interesting, because if this were a spending bill, um, under uh, the gentlewoman's party's majority, no one would have asked the question, how are you going to cover the deficit spending that's going to occur under the spending measure that you've introduced? Oh, we all and, how long, and how long was it going to be on the books? Rather, it is now a question that's asked only on these particular measures. Because what happened for a long time was, that the Congress and the House of Representatives especially spent money they didn't have. That's called deficit spending. And it was done regularly. That's called a structural deficit. And there was never any regard about how big a structural deficit was going to be caused by the spending. But I'm very, very sensitive to deficits. Very sensitive to deficits. My problem is a dollar spent in deficit isn't the same kind of dollar each time necessarily. If you had a dollar spent in deficit on spending, that contributes to an underlying structural deficit. I don't think that makes sense. A dollar spent in deficit investing in the economy to bring about growth so that people can have a job so they can pay taxes so you can make revenue on that deficit dollar spent is, I think, a wise investment. Our goal is to spend money at a time of deficit to produce a ro more robust economy, which will return more money in the short run, give people a job in the long run, have that job produce revenue, which produces more money than you invested in the first place. That, I think, is a wise deficit dollar. To say that the only dollar you should spend to stimulate the economy is a dollar you have kind of becomes a self-fulfilling promise. Because if you have a good economy that brings in surpluses, you don't need to stimulate the economy. If the decision in World War II was that we shouldn't do what we need to do to win the war because we can't spend money we don't have, we would have never won the war. What you need to do is do what you need to do in the time you need to do it. I believe it's appropriate now to spend a dollar in deficit to invest it in the economy to grow it. I think that is better 
than not doing anything at all. Thank and it's you, much Clinton. better than spending a dollar on a spending program when that dollar you spend on the spending program is a deficit dollar. Well, thank Best you, Mr. Way. Thomas. I appreciate uh, this lesson, and I do remember working hard to get the deficit down, but now if you'd answer my question, uh, if uh, is this is the spending bill that we have, it's not a spending bill, the tax bill, is it paid for? We have to borrow the money. And if we have to borrow the money, what do you anticipate the debt service to be? I don't know. Because when you try to ask this question, you're dealing with a dynamism, or I might say, an ability to produce change that otherwise wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. And this is a novel thing that we're beginning to look at called dynamic scoring. If you look at it statically, you aren't looking at a world that's real. If you look at it dynamically, you're beginning to see that actions taken produce change and behavior differently than otherwise would have occurred. And we haven't yet perfected the ability to look at and see the dynamic. It seems to me, if you create jobs and you put money in people's hands, which you people agree, certain things will happen that otherwise wouldn't happen. But I cannot give you a single dollar of debt service on a program which will generate more revenue and help remove the deficit. That's the goal rather than the narrow bookkeeping that the gentlewoman seeks. Well, I, I, I don't really. All I want to know is if we pass the bill tomorrow, are we going to know if how you're going to pay for it? Is it going to have to be borrowed money? It's going to add to the deficit. That's the only thing I want to know. In the short run, yes, it's an investment in tomorrow. Just as you do that when you buy a home and when you pay for a car that you don't have cash for, you invest. This is an investment in tomorrow. Mr. Rangel? I think the best way to find out uh, what the deficit is going to be is to find out how, what's the tax credit cuts going to be and how much money you have to borrow for it. So that dynamic scoring is that you don't have the tax going for it, you just go dynamic, but you find something. <laughs> Remove the sunsets, uh, you'll be able to see that they will say that this tax cut is going to cost a trillion dollars. And under that, you'll find a deficit's going to be a trillion dollars. Quite frankly, when Republicans uh, criticize me for not being that concerned about borrowing, I think they got a good point. Because what gets me about borrowing is not the money that you owe, but the interest you pay for the money that you borrow. And when okay, accountants share with me, that the, the debt on the money that we borrowed is going to be larger than all of the discretionary programs that come through this Congress, then sometimes, Mrs. Lord, I believe that this isn't a question of tax policy. This is a question of eliminating those programs. How in the world can people say they want to give a tax cut when the chairman of the committee hasn't the slightest clue as to how much this victory in, 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 in Iraq is, is going to be? How long are the troops going to be there? Where do we go from here? It would seem to me that all of these things should be considered, including the deficit. So says uh, uh, Chairman Greenspan. So says the Congressional Budget Office. But if you find someone that comes up with dynamic scoring, they don't have to answer to anybody. Well, I didn't hear your answer on how your measure is paid for. Our measure, our measure is paid for by what Republicans like to say we're going to do, and that's raise taxes. We don't raise taxes, but we freeze the taxes in the two top brackets, which means this is money that will be coming in that under existing law we would not be getting. They pay and so for the therefore, bill. we pay for the entire bill, $124 billion, we pay for it through this mechanism. And what we're saying is that if, as far as the American people is concerned, in my opinion, they would want to know which program they think is best for them, not which program they think fits into the four corners of the Rules Committee that has a history of waiving the rules 
and waiving the impediments when they want something debated on the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hastings. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Getting back to what we're about here, about uh, to writing of rules, and I know there's a great deal of discussion on waiving the rules, uh, and the chairman wrote to us, as he has always done, and asked us to come out with an appropriate rule. I would like to ask uh, the chairman if, he would, uh, if his expectation of the Rules Committee is to make an order only a substitute, which has always been the consideration we give the Ways and Means Committee when you're bringing a, a tax bill forward. I tell the gentleman the dialogue that I had with a gentleman from Texas, which deviates from the standard letter that I wrote, was to simply begin to point out to this committee that I think you're beginning to see a behavior pattern which will repeat itself, and that you need to be aware of that. And that is, the Democrats will present alternatives that they never present in committee, that they have a political rally to present, and then come here and demand that every rule that would deny their ability to take that measure to the floor be waived so that they never undergo the scrutiny of the professional staff and that they stack the deck in their favor. Because as you well know, we will bring measures through the committee subject to the rules of the House. And if it's a measure under the Budget Committee rules, we will craft a bill which is subject to the Budget rules. We will always be within the rules. They will begin to never be within the rules. And that's why I said, waive the rules or don't waive the rules. It doesn't affect my product. It obviously affects their product, because if they plied by the rules, brought it through the committee, and lived up to the budget rules, the measure you see in front of you wouldn't be the same. And what they want is simply an unfair advantage by being able to build a position that they'll present on the floor that they could never build under the rules. That's the point I wanted to make, and I think it's been made clearly. Yeah, I, I understand that. I, I, so I, waive the rules, don't waive the rules. Right. Our product will be able to meet that scrutiny. Theirs will not. If you want them to have a substitute, you're obviously going to have to waive every rule of God and man, because short of that, this measure that they're trying to bring to the floor won't be able to be there. They're asking for special privilege. If you choose to give it to them, then they get a bill we don't get to write, because we wrote ours under the rules, and that's your decision. Well, Mr. Hayes, can we, I briefly respond to the chairman's statement? Uh, of course, I, I don't ahead. want this rules committee to be referees for serious problems we have in procedure in the Ways and Means Committee. I would hope that we would not have to ask you ever to waive the rules. But I'm telling you, we are sick and tired of getting a bill notified the day before, being given to us that day, that we expect to mark it up, and then they got to tell us, he's got to tell us, that he's been fair to us, and that he's so afraid that we're asking for unfair advantage. How could we have an unfair advantage when he doesn't even share with us? I, I, I said in the committee, I'm surprised he didn't ask for this to come up on the suspension calendar. I mean, I cannot believe that he is so insecure that he believes because we asked to waive the rules to get a substitute because he worked all weekend on what? On the Bush bill? No. On the Republican bill? No. But on the Thomas bill. That's what we got on Tuesday. That's what we mocked up in the afternoon. And I'm telling him this. We don't want to take our problem here to the Rules Committee. But if he thinks one minute that we are prepared to accept that every time he has a bill, then I don't mind saying that he should be placed on notice that we will be hurried. So all of these threats that he's manufacturing that we're saying for the floor or for the Rules Committee, dismiss it. We will be hurried in the Ways and Means Committee. Well, let, you let, me, let, let me, I, I just want to, uh, boy, I didn't want to get between the dog and the fire hydrant right there, but I think I might have. <laughs> uh, let, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me say it in a, in a different way. Is the expectations of the Ways and Means, Means Committee, however we work this out, that if there is amendment made in order, it shall be a substitute? That is my question. 
Yeah, that's been the good. tradition. Now, having said all of that, that's good. That's all, thank you. I appreciate that. Now, out of Mr. Mr. Chairman, you'll be surprised out of all of this, I really see a silver lining. Because what we are witnessing right here today is two major political parties in this country bringing forth to this committee, the Rules Committee, asking us to make a rule to talk about tax relief and job growth for the American people. I can tell you, in the time that I've been in, in politics, uh, that hasn't happened where both parties are doing that. So, Mr. Chairman, I, listen, I, I think this is a very historic day because tomorrow the American people have an opportunity to make a choice of two choices, of ways, two, uh, two ideas of ways to reduce the tax burden and create jobs and growth for this country. I think we're, we're moving in the right direction. Chairman, you briefly. Absolutely. Uh, the gentleman was notified the week before that the committee would have a markup on a jobs and growth bill. What he's constantly said is that he didn't get to see our product. <laughs> what I heard from all of the minority members here, how impassioned they feel about the issue. I find it ironic that they couldn't create a bill to present to the Ways and Means Committee prior to seeing ours. Yet one day later, they had the banners in the bu uh, bunting and they presented one. Of course, it didn't fit the rules uh, because they wanted to uh, color outside the lines. And, and that's fine. But he had more than appropriate notice under the rules. There was a markup for a jobs and growth bill. The more he say, the more I support. Because he emailed on Friday when everyone was going home, the Bush's bill. And then on Tuesday, he did give us notice. When did we get it on Tuesday? On the markup Monday? On Monday? Monday, Monday, <laughs> Monday night. Monday night, we revealed the Thomas bill. And then Tuesday, we got the chairman's mark. Uh, no, I don't. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, let, me, let me say for the record, Mr. Thomas, that in this committee, we waive rules for God, man, and woman all the time. Um, this is not unusual. Uh, we do uh, all kinds of things up here that, uh, uh, that uh, sometimes defy, uh, well, fairness and common sense, but so it's not unusual that that happens up here. And both of you have, have, have spoken about dynamic scoring. And Mr. Thomas, I have a question for you. Does your, does your uh, report contain? Um, he, he's not able to hear you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Does your report uh, contain a uh, macroeconomic impact analysis? That will be provided prior to consideration of the bill, which is the uh, procedure under the rules. Well, but prior to the consideration of the bill, according to the rules, uh, Rule 13, Clause 2, it needs to be printed in the congressional record, which means it needs to be. So I, I don't want you to have to. I don't want to have to have you insist on asking for a waiver of the rules. No, I don't. Uh, so we will get. It'll be printed in the congressional record today. That's correct. Okay. Uh, if if the gentleman wants an additional explanation. No, I just want this to make sure you comply with the rules. This is the first time it's being done. I will comply okay. with the rules. Okay, that's, that's the, only, the only question, because if it's I'm, not in the congressional record, then you're going to need a waiver. Otherwise, you're in violation that. of the House rules. I understand yeah. that. Uh, the, uh, going to the, to the bill, um, you know, I, I mean, one of the frustrating things for me sitting here uh, is we're talking about, uh, you know, when you provided the bill to the Democrats and, and how you wrote the bill, is that this is a bill that should have been written in a bipartisan way. Uh, this is a bill, quite frankly, where Republicans and Democrats should have been in a room together from the very beginning. I mean, it's that important. And we're talking about a huge amount of resources that could be dedicated to pay for this bill. Uh, and instead, you know, we have a bill that, uh, quite frankly, the Democrats had no part uh, in, in no role in, in helping to formulate. Um, and if it is indeed supposed to be a jobs and economic growth plan, uh, it is certainly legitimate to talk about ways to aid our our, our states and our cities and towns. It's certainly legitimate to talk about how to help small businesses and, and manufacturing and a whole bunch of other things that are in the Democratic bill. But let me just, let me, let me, I was looking at the congressional record on March 8th, uh, 2001, when we had a similar discussion about the tax bill. Uh, and looking at some of the comments from the members of the Ways and Means Committee on the Republican side who participated in that debate, Mr. Portman of Ohio, said on the floor uh, about the bill that was considered at the time. We can disagree on the impact precisely whether it will help a lot or a little, but we know it will help the economy. Uh, people are talking about layoffs around the country. All the economic data is very troubling. We have to do this tax cut to give this economy a boost to be sure we can keep the good jobs we have and expand the economy and continue the prosperity that this country has enjoyed uh, over the last decade. Uh, Mr. English of Pennsylvania, on the floor said a recent study by the Heritage Foundation of HR3 suggests that this bill would 
clearly increase economic growth, increase investment, increase savings, increase family income, and over the next five years create 500,000 new jobs. Uh, you know, it's, uh, this is a way to stimulate the economy. Uh, Mr. B. Ryder of uh, Nebraska says this legislation will help strengthen our economy, create jobs, and put money uh, in the pockets of those who have earned it uh, and need it most. I mean, I guess my issue is that there's a credi credibility gap here. Uh, the fact of the matter is all these wonderful things that you said and members of, your, uh, of the majority party said two years ago, the fact of the matter is we have two million less jobs today. Um, our economy is going in the wrong direction. All the economic indicators are going in the wrong direction. Our, our states and our cities and towns are facing the worst fiscal crisis since the Great Depression. Um, and rather than responding to what real people are talking about outside of Washington, uh, look, states, our governors, Republican and Democratic governors, are looking for, looking for some help. And this is what we give them. This is the economic uh, growth and stimulus package, uh, the Jobs and Growth uh, Tax Act of 2003 that we give them. Uh, and so, from my point of view, um, you know, comparing what everybody said, what you said two years ago, to what the reality is now, I mean, there's not a lot of credibility, uh, I think, to, to, uh, to your argument that, uh, that this is indeed a, a jobs and, and growth package. And so I, I don't know if you want to respond to that, but it's just uh, it's interesting to look at what you said and what happened. Tell a gentleman in terms of the first part of his question, if there wasn't significant cross-fertilization in terms of Democrats and Republicans, why does the substitute contain so many of the items that we have in our bill as well? There's a great degree of commonality, and the chairman indicated that when he began. So I think the evidence is to the contrary. The two bills look significantly alike in a number of issues. That clearly shows that we've been thinking and working and talking and holding hearings and listening to the concerns. All of that was done. As far as the second part of the gentleman's so statement. So you believe that the bill that you're presenting is a, is a bipartisan, reflects bipartisan consensus in the Ways and Means Committee that you worked in a bipartisan way to create this HR2? Is, uh, is that that's your, your opinion of the product that you're presenting before this committee? What I said was, I'm looking at the Democrat substitute. It contains a significant number of items that are identical or similar to what we presented in our bill. Take the two bills together, there's a significant of bipartisanship. I don't know where they got their information if they didn't have the bill available in time to crib from it. And if what we did was so bad, why does it then show up in the Democratic substitute? At some point, you have to ask yourself, on point after point, when the Democrat substitute contains exactly the same thing the underlying bill contains, either what we did in the dead of night was write something that we did on our own, or the minority decided that what we did was pretty good, but wouldn't give us a vote because of the partisan aspect of the committee, but couldn't well, leave let me, let me, that really good stuff that we have in our bill alone, well, and you put it in well, your substitute. Well, 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 it's well, one or the other. You well, can't let, have it let both let me, ways. Let me, let me you can't criticize what we have time. in the bill there and is, then put exactly the same thing in yours. There are significant differences. I mean, the Democratic bill provides uh, unemployment benefits. Your bill provides none. I tell the, the gentleman that's I, I outside finished, the scope of the committee. I, I we don't have the jurisdiction the to deal bill, with that. Uh, provide, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, no. I, I, the points uh, you will mention I, are, are points that we cannot put into the bill under our jurisdiction. I don't want to talk about anything that's relevant to the people who are watching here today. I mean, people who are watching this sure. who very much are looking to the federal government to help with some relief. And, I'm and confident basically what we're doing here is hiding behind all, this, all these... Watching today. Oh, I'm sure of that, too, but that's yeah. okay. Well, I just tell the gentleman... He is talking about areas that are against the rules of the House for the Ways and Means Committee to include in a bill. I That's thought the all way, I'm saying. I, I mean, I, I was told on the floor today that we couldn't talk about unemployment benefits because it was the Ways and Means Committee's jurisdiction. Now, are you telling me that it's no longer the Ways and Means Committee's jurisdiction to deal with unemployment benefits? Does the gentleman want to go through the Democrat substitute point by point I, I'm just, and examine like which of those yeah. points it is the way in which you handle it? Some of what is done is under our jurisdiction. Much of what was done in the Democrat substitute is not. We can go point by point and examine it if the gentleman wishes. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to yield back my, my time. Yes, thank you. 
It's been kind of interesting to sit here and listen to the Democrats speak um, against deficits when 40 years and when, when uh, they controlled Congress, they deficit spent freely without any thought of balancing the budget till we got here in 95 and balanced the budget in two years. And I just want to remind people that, you know, we will be back in balance in nine years, um, provided everything goes as planned. And uh, we have some extenuating circumstances that have caused this problem. This isn't something that we just created. We had an attack on our country. We have been in a recession, and we have been through a war. And, and throughout history, whenever you are in those situations, they end up with deficit spending. And the purpose of this bill is to get us out of that and to help promote growth and jobs. And that's really what we're talking about here. So I just wanted for the record to state that. And I yield back my time. I've been through a lot of wars. Which war was it that we, after it was over, we cut taxes? We're talking about stimulating the economy, and the reason the economy is in a problem is because of a war. How about the Korean War? Mr. Hastings. Uh, re re uh, responding as a segue to what Mr. Rangel said, and in response to my good friend, uh, from North Carolina and my colleague here. Um, there is no evidence of there having been any tax cuts uh, uh, during um, a war. All of us recognize the crisis that we're in. And I also would respond well, to the general, I, I will yield. not yield. You did not yield, nor did the chair permit uh, you to yield. I'll give you an opportunity after I get a chance to address you, Mr. Linda, for what you said earlier. But at the moment, I'm going to talk about uh, what, uh, on my time, um, of, of what Ms. Merrick just said. Uh, Ms. Merrick said in the 40 years that the Democrats were in control that there were deficits. Well, Ms. Merrick, uh, you and I were here, and you and I participated to a relative degree, perhaps in different ways, in allowing that when the Bush administration assumed its responsibilities, there was a $1 trillion surplus. Now, that was before 911, and that was before Afghanistan and Iraq. But the fact of the matter is uh, that we do have those matters uh, to consider. Perhaps Mr. Linda might want to stay and hear my comment when he commented earlier that indeed facts are stubborn things. And the gentleman went on, we were talking about the trickle-down theory that was advanced during the Reagan administration. I would ask uh, the gentleman and give him an opportunity, if the chair permits, to respond. Does the gentleman remember the statistics on the national debt during that same period uh, that he earlier cited? Um, and uh, the one thing that at least President Reagan did uh, was direct dollars to the states. And the evidence appears here that President Bush won't even do that. Now, does the gentleman remember that national debt? And you allege that I speak disparagingly. I do not speak disparagingly. Uh, indeed, facts are stubborn things. And we did have uh, staggering debt during that period of time. General Yale, I will, I, I, yield to I will say general. that we increased the debt by about $3 trillion. And in fact, the reason we increased the debt is because we spent too much. And I criticize Ronald Reagan for not vetoing all those spending measures. But if you're going to argue that cutting taxes, which doubled the size of the economy from two and a half trillion to five trillion dollars over eight years, and double the revenues to the Treasury are the cause of deficits, then you've studied different economics than I have. I understand uh, where you and I are coming from. Um, I study street economics. And we can be up here all we want to talking about a structured rule or waivers on rules. The American people feel like we are waving past them as it pertains uh, to education and prescription drugs and housing. And this is a bad bill. Therefore, the rule, it doesn't matter um, uh, when it gets out there. Let me ask Mr. Uh, Rangel a substantive question. Um, uh, uh, the latest revenue uh, data for the current fiscal year shows revenues running uh, $100 billion below estimates. That's as of um, uh, two weeks ago. How can we afford, Mr. Rangel, a tax cut whose interest alone, now I'm not talking about all this dynamic scoring. I, 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 the American people are tired of us being uh, too doggone dynamic up here. Uh, what they're interested in is us being practical and pragmatic. 
The interest alone will cost more than a trillion dollars over the life of this bill. And I heard you just a moment ago talk about borrowing and the interest it has to pay on it. In your judgment, then, uh, with revenue running below estimates, how are we going to be able to afford uh, this particular tax cut? Judge Hastings, the question really is, what is it that the majority wants to afford? We know their utter contempt <laughs> for Social Security and Medicare. We also know that they believe that education and health care should not be a federal responsibility but a local and state issue. If indeed the deficit gets so large that the debt that we're paying on it pushes these other programs on the side because we can't afford to do it, then you will get in the future what you are beginning to see now as we cut the federal contributions to the state and tell the states that we're going to give you a block grant, we're getting out of this, you figure out what to do. And in the city and state of New York, we find that we can't afford to assume the responsibility that was the federal government. At the end of the day, and many Republicans have been honest enough to say it, that they believe that our great government has two responsibilities, and that is a strong national defense and raise the taxes to pay for it. Everything else should be a local and state responsibility. We are seeing this happening now. We did it under the Clinton administration, uh, under the so-called welfare reform. And this was an experience that didn't work for Clinton, and with, we are attempting to do it with Medicare now, and it won't work for the Republicans, because the American people are not concerned whether we get a waiver for the rule. They want to know what are we doing about the joblessness, the pain that they're feeling, and how can we afford to give a half a trillion dollars in a tax cut when they're not even registered on the, re the receiving end? My final question, with the chair's permission, would be to ask Chairman Com uh, Thomas, um, between now and 2013, um, people who are described as millionaires, and I, I wish to make it very clear, I hold absolutely no grudge uh, toward anyone that has earned uh, uh, their money honestly and are millionaires. I also don't, I know four billionaires personally, and not one of them has said a mumbling word to me about a tax cut. And my millionaire friends, I might add, also don't talk about tax cuts, but all of my poor friends talk about housing and education and prescription drugs. Uh, but nevertheless, millionaires are going to profit somewhere uh, considerably without trying to attach a figure from some policy center or from the left or the right. It would appear uh, that um, uh, uh, between now and uh, the sunset date, 2013, um, uh, for certain provisions of the tax cuts, that a lot of it is going to go uh, to fairly wealthy people. So then the dividend and capital gains tax cuts, um, uh, two provisions that I perceive as, in some respects, largely rewarding upper-income uh, Americans, they last for 10 years. But the marriage penalty relief, the child tax credit, and the wider 10 percent tax bracket um, uh, 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 I might add, uh, Chairman Thomas, your hometown newspaper, or at least your state newspaper, uh, reports you as saying um, uh, that um, you acknowledge that the three-year limit on the politically popular family tax break is not intended to stand as a uh, policy. I don't know about the context. I don't know whether that's accurate or not. I offer no accusation. But I ask you whether uh, the three provisions that help all Americans or that end after three years, why is that as opposed to the 10 years of uh, where uh, upper income Americans are more likely to gain? There is a transition to the underlying statute. What the gentleman also needs to understand is that this bill is primarily, in that aspect, a stimulus. The budget rules under which this measure was written provide for $1.2 billion in tax reductions. This is just a $550 billion package. A trillion. A trillion, thank you very much. Um, if the gentleman doesn't believe that we ought to continue to examine the way we change taxes under the $1.2 trillion amount of the budget resolution, 
I understand that. One of the difficulties in dealing with the progressive income tax is the very fact that it's progressive. The more you make, the more you pay. And when you make an adjustment in the tax structure, those who pay more get a progressively adjusted amount. What this bill actually does, and this I think is an area where frankly we should be looking absolutely in a bipartisan way, is take almost three million Americans of moderate income off of the alternative tax proposal. This measure invests $52 billion in making that adjustment. And what we want to focus on is the ability of people in the 10 and 15 percent bracket to utilize dividends and capital gains for a very practical reason Mr. for the entire Mr. period. Chairman, but let me tell you respect, why. What about the three year sunset? That's what I asked you. I didn't ask you for this option. No, you wanted to know why you, you wanted to know why the capital gains and the dividends ran for the entire ten years. More and more moderate income Americans no longer have defined benefit pensions. They have defined contribution pensions. And one of the best things we can do is to encourage them to invest that contribution so their pension can grow. Inevitably, if you want money to grow, you have to put it in capital assets, stock market, in other areas where money can grow. And so the 5% tax rate for the moderate income Americans with uh, defined contributions for benefits is designed to get them a bigger stake for retirement. That's the growth part of the package. The points that you are emphasizing that aren't in there for the 10 years is the stimulus part of the package. As I indicated, on the child credit, over three years, our plan put $600 more in the pocket of every mother or father who has a child. That's $600 for every child. We did that because we think it's smarter to try to stimulate the economy by front-loading it rather than giving a smaller amount and stretch it out over the entire decade. That then becomes simply giving someone more money. It isn't stimulative. If you want to stimulate the economy, you have to give them more up front. We do that. Uh, well, the gentleman... Mike, Mike. Mike. Your microphone on, Mr. Rankin. We'd like to hear your statement. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. You're just too kind. <laughs> if you want to believe the chairman, then you would, he would have you to believe that giving tax breaks for child credits and accelerating the marriage relief standard deduction is only a temporary thing. That we're going to give this benefit for two or three years, and that's just to stimulate the economy. Well, I don't want to be around when that expires, and this Congress is saying that you've had your stimulation. No, Judge Hastings, what this means is that we're trying to get a trillion dollar tax cut into a $550 billion limit. And so the entire bill probably would cost a lot more, but it doesn't fit the four corners, and so we gotta let these people know. Or maybe we'll talk about it tomorrow on the floor, don't get too carried away with this benefit. And for God's sake, don't have any kids after three years, because this is for a different type of stimulation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. M might I respond? Oh, well, I just, uh, I don't want to belabor this, but something that Mr. Thomas said I don't believe is correct. I don't think he intentionally intended to misrepresent anything. Uh, he was talking about, you know, the virtues of the lower taxation on dividends for the uh, uh, new type of pension plans, for the uh, type that many people are participating in. I believe that while that money is accumulating, it's tax-free, mm -hmm. that there are no taxes paid on those dividends until after you retire. And I, I don't think you meant to suggest that uh, people who are investing in these type of pension plans have to pay taxes on the dividends into, uh, between now and when they retire. I appreciate the gentleman clarifying the point, but of course I did not because that's not the intent. However, more and more people 
uh, who use computers and have software to determine what's going to occur with the capital as it accumulates have automatic multipliers that determine what your tax obligation is versus what you make. And that is built in so that when you say you only have to pay 5% tax and when you consult with your uh, retirement counselor, they indicate the lower tax creates a greater after-tax return at the lower income, means this is an area where you can now possibly think about investing that you wouldn't have been able to before. But, but you were not suggesting that investments no. made in that pension fund uh, are taxable uh, in no. the year that they're made. No, it's that it's attractive to get people to go into areas they now tend not to go into because ultimately the tax effect will be less. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Bill, a couple weeks ago uh, when I was having town hall meetings, I knew we would be here before the Rules Committee uh, working on a tax package. Uh, I, I didn't know what it would look like, but I was rather confident when I spoke to say that People that have money in their pockets do one of two things, either they spend it or they save it. Both of those elements seem to be good for me. Uh, we stimulate the economy or we provide money in terms of savings or it goes into the stock market, which tends to uh, grow and allow other people uh, to, to, to have savings and, and uh, jobs off of that because it stimulates the economy. I think what we've got here is a circumstance where we're really trying to argue about how are we going to grow the economy, how are we going to bring the stock market, how are we going to do all these things which would bring stability back to uh, a huge number of people. I think this is about helping a whole bunch of people, not a small amount of people. And I know that there's a lot of animosity with people who don't like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and Michael Dell because they're, you know, these people with money, but I think they created jobs and an incredible amount of wealth in this country, uh, which does separate America from the other countries of the world because we have these kind and benevolent men who help us uh, in so many uh, gracious ways also. But I, I think that what I'm after as a Republican, as a member of Congress is how are we going to stimulate the economy? How are we going to bring the stock market back? How are we going to create jobs? How are we going to have a stable uh, stock market so that our retirement accounts uh, and other things which, which we place our money into the stock market for reflect that opportunity to stabilize? And I hearken back to the days of the uh, of 1993 when uh, President Clinton offered that uh, income tax, uh, huge tax increase. And as I recall, it took until 1997 until we were able to see the benefits of that uh, tax increase, but that instead of it being the tax increase that produced the great economy, it in fact was the capital gains tax cut, where we were encouraging people to stimulate and work harder. I, I like what you've done uh, because you're going to increase money as revenue to the government as well as increase revenue to people who are investors and who are taxpayers and who are families to this country. And I just wondered if you could take a minute and tell me, am I right or am I wrong? Is that the projection? Are we trying to help people get jobs? Are we trying to stimulate the economy? Are we trying to do something for the stock market? And that that's why you have this fabulous Bill Thomas bill that in fact accomplishes not just one or two things, but it accomplishes each one of those because I'm concerned not just about jobs, and not just about more take-home pay, but I'm concerned about the stock market also. And I'd appreciate it if you take a minute and, and let me know what you think. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, one of the things that is not often remembered is, as you indicated correctly, uh, it was the, um, uh, the then majority Democrats who raised taxes. Uh, but what's seldom remembered is that the very next Congress, Republicans became in the majority, and then we didn't spend the way spending had been uh, done before. And it was a combination that produced um, the surplus because six of the eight years of the Clinton presidency was with Republicans controlling the purse strings as according to the Constitution in Article I. 
As Greenspan said just a few weeks ago, and this is true in terms of uh, economic cycles, creation of jobs lags the recovery. And he said correctly, uh, with the quick ending of the war in Iraq, and you're already beginning to see the anticipation of cheaper petroleum prices, one of the key market basket components is the price of gasoline, and you're beginning to see crude oil futures come down. This economy has been sustained by consumers for far too long. But we still need their help. That's why in those areas of putting money in the hands of consumers immediately. If you have a child through the child credit, in terms of the marriage penalty, in terms of accelerating the rates, all of them to go into effect January 103, you're producing more cash in the hands of individuals. That's to help the consumers sustain uh, the demand. But correctly, Chairman Greenspan said, we need to begin to focus on jobs. What we've done in this package, and I'm pleased to see has been duplicated to a very great extent in the Democrats' package, and um, uh, I guess they feel we got this part right, was to provide a, a kind of a sale mentality on buying depreciable assets now. We're not asking that over the decade something happened, because ironically, if you made this permanent over the decade, people would decide to buy when they wanted to. What we're trying to do is to encourage them to buy now. How do you encourage to buy now? You say, we're having a sale. We'll take 50% off. You can pay it cash and don't have to worry about depreciating it. Or for your small business, you have the ability to do that. What we do on the net operating loss is provide an ability to take profits today profits yesterday and apply them to losses today so you can actually have the cash to buy. Who are we directing it to? Businesses, small and large. What we're trying to do is stimulate for jobs. But you're quite right, there are three parts to this program, I tell a gentleman from Texas, and the third part is to get people to look at spending money in the stock market and for other capital assets. How do you get them to do it? You say your marginal rate of return will be greater. But if you say, like you're trying to do in terms of stimulating the economy, the sale will only be good for two or three years, you don't get the economy to grow. People have to have the belief that they can do it today, tomorrow, and the day after. That's why those provisions are in there for the decade. That's the growth part of the measure. It's stimulative in part one, it's jobs in part two, and it's trying to sustain longer-term growth in part three. I believe it meets all of the needs that the American economy needs today, and I believe a majority of members of the House tomorrow will agree with us, and I thank the gentleman for the opportunity. I, I would yield to the gentleman. Very briefly, I just would ask uh, uh, that um, uh, the record reflect a statement made by Warren Buffett, who I certainly have no animosity uh, uh, toward, and I don't know anyone that does. But he um, is reported in the Wall Street Journal as having said to senators um, uh, that getting rid of the tax on dividends, as uh, is proposed by the president, would reduce his federal tax bill by $300 million a year. Mr. Buffett said uh, that that would mean he would pay proportionately less in taxes than his secretary, and he told the senators that he thought it was a mistake. So I certainly don't have any animosity toward a rich man like that coming forward yeah. of, of with well, government. If, if, if this member implied at all that it was a statement that you had made, because no, I, no, I, I, I did good, not say you said good, 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 Chairman, I, w I would yield to the gentleman. And that was a comment on the president's plan, which is not before us. I also might indicate that when people say there's no net gain to the economy, if anybody's been in a room when you play poker, the amount of money that is there at the end of the day as compared to the beginning has not changed. But who holds it changes. That's one of the reasons we want to lower the tax for low and moderate income people so they can wind up holding more of the stake at the end of the day. I think yeah. that's stimulative and it's growth inspiring. That's, that's, I understand. Understand. that's Bill yeah. Bennett. Yeah, I was going to ask the gentleman about Bill Bennett and whether he's, whether yeah. he's explained that to Mr. Bennett or not. Mr. Reynolds. 
Well, we have a long hearing to get f ahead of us, Mr. Chairman, so I thought I'd uh, just be brief in, in the fact that I do believe that cutting taxes helps create jobs and stimulate the economy. And when the president brought a thought of a, looking at an economic stimulus package again as an agenda that he put forth, uh, we had about 535 ideas in the Congress, and our constituents had uh, certainly many more than that. But today, as I look this over, we're no longer going to debate about whether we're going to have a tax cut and an economic stimulus program or not. And that's good news to me, because I look the majority of these amendments have some way they want to offer their thoughts to what tax cuts and deductions should be. And the debate here has been the same as what I've seen in Ways and Means and what I've seen in the coffee shops across America, and that is, how do we do it? So our job tonight in the Rules Committee, as we listen to a majority of these tax-cutting, tax-deduction solutions that are uh, going to come before this, in addition to the chairman and the ranking member with his substitute, uh, will be uh, the aspect that tomorrow, as the Rules Committee does its job and puts this bill onto the floor, there's going to be a great debate in the House, but it appears to me that it's going to be on what type of tax cut, what type of economic stimulus versus if there should be one. Uh, as I said, have uh, an action-packed hearing ahead, only 17 more witnesses, and you've opened the first two hours of the hearing very well. And uh, we look forward to consideration of this uh, bill on the floor tomorrow. Thank you. I want to thank the gentleman, the ranking member. It's always a pleasure to appear before wonderful the to be Committee. Wonderful to be with you both. Thank you all very much. Uh, our next witness is the uh, committee member, Mr. McDermott, gentleman from Washington. Please, please come forward and... Uh, and let me just say that if you have prepared remarks, they will without objection appear in the record in their entirety, and we will uh, welcome a summary from you. So please turn the microphone on and proceed as you see fit. Mr. Chairman, I, um, okay. watching this uh, hearing, was reminded of something that Henry Gonzalez once told us in the banking committee that <clears throat> One thing he learned from an old guy in, t in San Antonio was never try and lasso a cow running downhill. And uh, watch, watching these first two hours was a little like that, and I don't know whether I can keep up that level of uh, uh, interest or not, but uh, there's several things that have been said here which I think um, play into my amendment. Um, Mr. Reynolds and Mr. Sessions. Uh, one said that um, the people know how to spend their own money. Just give the people their money, and they know how to do what to do with it. And um, I think that uh, what we are looking at here is what Mr. Reynolds says. We're really looking at how to do it. If we want to stimulate the economy by a tax cut, I don't think we need a tax cut. But if we're going to do it, then and I, I figured out the votes, uh, and I now know something's going to pass. So the question really is, what should it be? Um, HR 2 delivers nearly 80% of its benefits to those who make more than $90,000 a year, 80%. Um, like Mr. Thomas said, as he left the table here, the, the, uh, the uh, poker table, the only thing that happens at the end of the game is the money's moved around to different people. And so most of this money is going to the people making more than 90000 That's 6 percent of the workforce. And the, uh, <clears throat> that means that people making a million dollars will get $105,000 in tax break, whereas people making 40000 will get $325. Now, that's, that's some poker game we're playing here. And the amendment which I have presented to the committee is really to uh, to do something to shift the end of the game. It's to say at the end of the game, the money ought to be with the people down at the bottom because according to Mr. Sessions, they know what to do with the money. I think people down who make thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 know absolutely as much about what to do with money as people who make a million. There's no dummies down at 40000 They're all making do with a whole lot less, so you've got to be smarter, actually, to get by on that. 
And what this bill does is to, or what my amendment does, is to give them a tax holiday on their withholding tax. Withholding tax, everybody pays. Everybody pays it on the first $86,000 of their income. And if you give them back, if you give everybody back their withholding tax on the first $20,000, they would get a, a, a tax refund of about a thousand and a half, about $1,500 at the end of the year. That means $170 billion will go into the hands of the people at the bottom of the scale. 96% of this tax cut of mine goes into the people below uh, $80,000. So it really is a question of philosophy. If you want the bill that's before us, uh, you certainly will have a chance to vote on that. But I think you ought to have a chance to vote on a bill that allows people to, uh, or allows the Congress to give money to people at the bottom. Now, why is that so? Why do I think that will stimulate the economy? Every blessed nickel that you give to those people at the bottom will go straight into the economy. Um, and it will preserve jobs and create jobs. If people who are making $40,000 a year have the money, they will go out to dinner They'll buy a new shirt. They'll do a lot of things that they won't do if they don't have that $1,500. So I think that you are looking at a real stimulus for the economy in the short term. Um, some people will say, oh, but you're taking money away from Social Security. No, I'm not. Because I give in this amendment the ability for the uh, actuaries at the Treasury, the, the power to lift the cap on the income that's taxed uh, in order to make enough, enough additional revenue to pay it back over the next three years. So it's a short-term stimulus for one year, and it's paid back over three years. And in fact, the uh, Social Security um, income or the Social Security trust fund is whole at the end of that period of time. So I, I really hope that um, you will do this. I think that. Uh, looking at what's going on in the states today, you have an enormous problem in every single state. There isn't anybody sitting at this dais or at this table with me that doesn't come from a state that is having severe financial difficulties. And we're not doing anything for them. And what we will be doing with this is we will be giving additional money to people in the working class so that they can share with those people out there who don't have unemployment benefits, who have to move in with their sisters since they lost their job, or move back with the folks because they lost their job. These are the people who are going to be getting this 1500 bucks, and I can put it to very good use. They can use it for child care. They can use it for whatever they want. They would have the right to make the decision. And I think that um, this amendment is a worthy amendment, and it gives people a chance to say, do you want to give the money to the top or to the bottom? What kind of a, what kind of a poker game is this? Is it a fair poker game, or is it a game where we know who the winners are going to be before we, when we sit down? Right now, we know who the winners are going to be. It's people making more than $90,000 a year. Nobody else wins in this thing unless you consider $425 a big win for somebody making $40,000. If you're a millionaire and you get $100,000, that is a win. So I offer this amendment to the committee, and uh, I, we considered it in the, um, the committee itself. Uh, I came up a few votes short, and uh, I think that the tide is turning and it will be Positive Thank you very floor. much, Mr. McDermott. We appreciate your being here, and thanks for your uh, thoughtful proposal, Mr. Goss. Mr. Slaughter? Mr. Linder? I have a couple of comments. Oh. The, the no economy questions. of the United States is not a poker game. It's not a zero-sum game, and both sides have made that mistake. We had a $2.5 trillion economy in 1980, and we have an $11 trillion economy now. And people who get tax breaks and invest it create jobs. The, what seems to be so offensive to the left anymore is that the people who pay taxes are going to get tax relief. The top 1% of the income earners pay 38% of all the taxes. 
and the bottom 50% collectively pay, le pay less than 3% of all income taxes. And now you don't want them even to pay for their own retirement. It's fascinating that we have relieved 50% of the income earners from paying for our defense, for our parks, for our court system, for our FBI, and now you don't even want to pay for their own retirement benefits. We have created a huge bias in this country by removing so many people from paying for their own government. And the bias is for more government because they're disproportionate beneficiaries and more taxes because they're not paying. The, the, the simple fact is that when you cut taxes, the people who paid the taxes get the relief. And that seems to offend too many people. I yield back. Well, may I just make a short response to that? I didn't choose the poker game as the analogy. I know that. The chairman of the committee did. I know that. And so it's wrong in his part I think it's a, it's a crapshoot, basically, our economy, not a poker game. And I really think that the, the issue here is why should all of you up here get a tax break about May or June when you no longer have to pay on your Social Security? Why shouldn't you pay Social Security tax on your income all through the year like the average working folks do? Be because Half the, the social people sitting behind you have to pay all year. Because the Social Security system was set up biased so that the people who have low income and pay in on the, on the whole dollars get 90% of their, of their salary when they retire, and the people at the upper incomes who pay in on a portion of it get 15% of their salary when they retire. This whole thing is built that way, and you know that. But you, you understand about insurance, um, social insurance. I, I know you don't like the concept, but the idea you of social that. insurance... That's unfair to you say you don't know well, that. Well, you, you're, you're deriding the fact that rich put in more and get less out in the end. No, I'm just saying that's a fact. Well, of course it's a fact. There, that's the and answer. that's what a social insurance program is. The same with Medicare. Some people pay into Medicare, and they never get anything out of it, right? That's correct. You don't want anything out of it. You don't sit at home saying, gee, I hope I can collect from my Medicare. That's certainly, there's no one who would do that in a society. We, we put things together the same way with the fire department. The fire department, we put our money in and we put a fire department together, never hoping we have to use it. And the same is true of Social Security. And I don't think there's any reason why we shouldn't, if you're going to give tax relief, why don't you give tax relief to the people at the bottom? Because don't you taxes. don't think they contribute to campaigns? They or don't is pay it taxes. Because, I'm sorry? Because the 50% of the lowest income earners don't pay income taxes. You don't call a payroll tax a tax? I Go back to your district and make that statement. I said income tax. You'll have the I know what you're, I know you're very finely choosing the word income tax. But the average Joe, when he pulls that envelope open and looks in there, he knows he pays taxes. And you can use all the fancy language you want, but he knows that he's paying taxes. They pay a big, that's the biggest part of their taxes every single month. And I'm saying, give some of that back to them. That's, that's some of your more interesting comments. I'm sure there's a thought lurking in there, but I didn't detect it. Mr. McGovern. Well, first of all, let, let me thank the gentleman for his testimony, and um, I appreciate his sentiment. And, um, uh, but I, 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 like him, uh, question the whole, uh, the whole validity of this idea of having a tax cut at this particular time when our states and our cities and our towns are, are facing their worst fiscal crisis uh, since the Great Depression. Uh, we have uh, communities that um, you know are having trouble meeting their infrastructure needs, uh, roads and bridges, and you know uh, water and sewer uh, construction projects that they're trying to undertake, which are all very key to their economic development and growth. Um, we have uh, schools in, in in my congressional district that, because of the state uh, budget crunch, are, are being shut down. Um, we have uh, we we all talk about homeland security up here. Uh, I get, I get in my home city, we're laying off 20 cops and 20 firefighters, uh, and that's happening all throughout the state of Massachusetts. It's happening all throughout the country uh, right now. And um, and I agree. If you want, if you if you're going to go the idea, if you're going to if you married to the idea of a tax cut, I mean the gentleman's right. We you know I think where you're going to stimulate the economy the most is helping those um, uh, in the lower income brackets and those in the middle, because I think they're more likely to spend the money and make a difference in the economy than those those at, at the top. Um, but, uh, you know, my, uh, my friends on the other side keep on talking about all these tax cuts, uh, but they're actually, you know, passing on a tax increase to our children and our, our grandchildren, something called the debt tax. 
uh, DEBT. And uh, I mean, this is, uh, this is adding to our deficits, adding to our debt in ways that, uh, you know, I think we'll have a very difficult time explaining to our children and our grandchildren. I mean, we're supposed to be working on their behalf here and making our community stronger. And this, you know, is not going to do anything for jobs. It's not going to grow our economy. We've been here before. We were here two years ago. This is not the way to go right now. And we have a crisis. Uh, and rather than responding to the crisis at hand, we're kind of going back to the same old stuff. And so I appreciate the gentleman's comments. I appreciate his sentiment. I hope uh, his amendment is made in order. Um, if you had to have a tax bill, I'd rather have his tax bill than the one that's being uh, proposed. But, uh, but I, I, I question the whole approach that we're taking here. I think, I think we're making a huge mistake. Well, I happen to be a member who um, thinks that debate on issues should be saved for the floor, Mr. Chairman. And just because the cameras are on and the microphones are on, we have a list of 17 witnesses, and we've only finished with two of them in two hours. And so I will reserve my remarks for the floor tomorrow, and I thank you for the opportunity. Give, give us enough time so we can have a debate tomorrow, will you? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, our next witness is the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Smith. We're uh, happy to have you, Mr. Smith. Let me uh, uh, say to you, Mr. Chairman, uh, the reason I'm taking a couple of valuable Please turn your microphone time. on, and uh, well, that, that, the that, that, clocks will be on the right record. Anyway, thank you for letting me take a, a couple minutes of your time. It's because it's uh, an issue that I think is very important. I wrote it when I was uh, chairman of the Senate uh, uh, Finance Taxation Committee in Michigan. It's the most unfair thing for business. It discourages productivity by discouraging purchases of equipment, and it's called neutral cost recovery. And uh, uh, we passed neutral cost recovery. We put neutral cost recovery in the contract with America. Uh, we passed it out of the House. When it got to the Senate, it failed and didn't go any further. Uh, this amendment says for the small business, as designed by this tax bill, allow uh, these businesses to put uh, the purchase on a depreciation schedule uh, that would give them the same advantage as if they expensed it or had first-year depreciation. So it indexes the depreciation schedule uh, mostly for inflation, a little bit for the time value of money. So you simply have a factor that you multiply what you're allowed to depreciate uh, by a neutral cost recovery factor uh, that uh, doesn't uh, give the government more money. Let me just give you the, the percentages of what it calls uh, in terms of increased cost. Uh, if you're allowed neutral cost recovery or expensing, it reduces the cost of that equipment or facility by 17 percent. And uh, that encourages more better facilities, more, uh, more better efficient equipment, and it increases our competitive situation. Uh, just having expensing means a company that doesn't make enough money in any one year to uh, equal the amount or greater than that cost of that machinery or facility, then he can't expense it. Uh, so for those businesses that need it the most, those businesses, uh, like a lot of farms, that want to buy uh, a whatever, a $100,000 uh, piece of equipment but are only having a profit of 20000 a year, then they can, in that year of purchase, they can only expense 20000 This provision would allow them to expense, to put it on a depreciation schedule, uh, the rest of that purchase and not be disadvantaged by depreciation. And for a quick review, uh, we ended up with depreciation schedules to bring money, more, more, more tax money into to, to the government. In 1950s, we had what was called a, uh, a, uh, a tax credit for new purchases, an investment tax credit. We did away with that, and now we need to do something in addition to expensing to encourage uh, new purchases. And that's the amendment. Thank you. Members will note this is not on the uh, overall index list. It's a separate amendment that uh, they have here. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, Ms. Slaughter? Uh, here you are. Uh, Mr. Smith, I've just always found you one of the more thoughtful members of Congress. You're, you're, it's a very you're, you're, good idea. 
Um, I, I'm sure that will be allowed, and I, I hope that it will. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say I, I, I haven't reviewed the entire member, but it sounds on the face of it like a pretty good idea, and I, I'd certainly in this committee vote to make it an order. I can't vote for my colleagues, but I will certainly vote to give you an opportunity to debate Thank this you. tomorrow. Chairman, thank you very much. After listening to the debate for the last two hours, I, I wonder whether all of us are talking together because I'm, I'm not sure that there certainly isn't a difference that we don't want to help the economy and help our fellow citizens, but boy, we have a, a distinct difference as to what the causes of our problem are, what the potential solution is. I, I can't uh, say with any definitiveness that either philosophical position is absolutely correct, but I would caution the committee, uh, uh, this is a unique uh, recession. It's an overcapacity recession. And unfortunately, a lot of standardized tools, whether they be in the tax cut or tax manipulation stimulation area or in the uh, stimulus to uh, demand, are really going to solve this inflation. And I think we ought to heed some of the advice of the open committee yesterday and just worry about the potential deflation and what that would mean to this country and how this government would have to respond. And I dare say we have few tools that I'm aware of to make that response. All that having been said, I come here not with any proposal to uh, uh, stimulate the economy with tax cuts or uh, extraordinary expenditures, but I, I do propose a special piece of legislation that I've been t attempting to have the Congress address over the last three years. And it has to do with fundamentally addressing some disadvantaged areas in the United States that have been disadvantaged for decades upon decades. And they are basically the areas that uh, are beneficiaries of the Abandoned Mine Land Fund to recover and reclaim pre-1979 coal lands in the United States. I'm looking at the judge. She certainly knows how much of Ohio would qualify for that. In Pennsylvania, we've identified literally hundreds of thousands of acres that qualify. Now, our problem basically is that under existing policy and existing methods of attacking this by appropriation through the AML program, it will only take us 200 years to uh, uh, environmentally bring back these coal lands in the United States. And in the meantime, these areas, whether they be in Harlan, Kentucky, or northeastern uh, Ohio, or in almost any part of Pennsylvania, will be economically distressed relative to the rest of the uh, country. Uh, they locally, and regionally, and statewide do not have the funds to recover their lands. And even the federal government uh, projects if they spent all of the trust fund money, that it would take 200 years to make the recovery, but we're not spending all the trust fund money under the existing expenditure program, it would actually take 400 years to make the recovery. I, I remind you that the Constitution of the United States was just signed 214 years ago, so that all of us that remain in Congress over the next 400 years will finally be able to cut ribbons that we've returned the desecrated coal mining lands of the United States to correction. Now, what does it really mean and who does it affect? What I'm asking to do is get off this craziness of appropriating money on a yearly basis to try and do minimal projects that fix nothing, are terribly expensive, and as I said, it would take 200 years to correct. Two, I'm suggesting that we have a methodology that could be in place that would be counter-cyclical. That is, when recession occurs, as we have now, we could wisely speed up the expenditure and the reclamation progress to clean our environment, prepare the land for future development, and actually help recover all the funds expended over a relatively short period of time. My bill copies really two bills that have passed the House in the past. The Qualified Zone Academy Bonds for Education, we use a tax credit bond to accomplish this, so there's no appropriated funds and no debt in the United States immediately that's incurred to do the program. 
The second thing is we take uh, the observations made of the Everglades recovery in recognizing that it takes federal participation to accomplish this. And what I suggest is that we create an authority under my bill, which I'd like to be as attached to an amendment offered under the tax bill, that we authorize the administrator of the Economic Development Administration to take proposals for comprehensive recovery planned on a regional basis, to be implemented on a regional basis, not by a Washington bureaucracy, and, and authorize the sale of tax credit bonds to appropriate investors over a period of 30 years, and the interest to be paid would not be paid either by the lender or by the government, but would be made available to the investor by a tax credit. That would cost the United States government a loss of revenue of approximately $1 billion a year. Rather minuscule when we're talking about this $550 billion tax program. And in 30 years, at the loss of revenue at a maximum, it will actually be less than a billion dollars a year, but at 5 percent it would be a billion dollars a year, we would have recovered all of the spoiled millions of acres of coal land in 26 states and 126 congressional districts. That for the first time in 150 years, they have, would have returned their environment to an equal status with the rest of this country. In the meantime, it would have performed a tremendous stimulus economically in these areas. It would prepare these distressed areas of the country for further economic development in the future. It would save taking pristine land that is now being utilized for industrial and other development purpose and would use this spoiled land in a recycled way which would indicate smart growth. We can accomplish this, I said, with a loss of merely a billion dollars of revenue a year over the next 30 years. The bonds are self-financing. The sinking fund would be established immediately upon the authorization of the sale of bonds that the bond principal would be, would be retired in 30 years. So no one would be obliged to pay anything on principal. They'd be self-funding. The interest rate would be recaptured by the investor through a tax credit. The federal government would lose a maximum of $1 billion a year, and it would put fairness for those of my friends on the Republican side, right now we fund this recovery through taxing existing coal companies, most of them in the state of Wyoming, that had nothing to do with causing the problem, are put at an unfair disadvantage in competing with other utilities, electric, nuclear, et cetera, all because they happen to be in the coal business. I don't know who came up with the formula, but I think it's quite frankly the most un-American and anti-supply and demand concept I've ever seen. In, in attempting to pay for a program. Here we'd be spreading the loss of revenue to all taxpayers at something less than a billion dollars a year. In 30 years, we would recover all of the devastated land, not only reclaiming the land, but reclaiming the entire environment. And I can speak for the area of the country that I represent. 14 areas of, of northeastern Pennsylvania, as a result of coal practices of more than 150 years ago, pollute man-made pollution to more than 50 percent of the Chesapeake Bay pollution in, a, in an area of only 20 miles. And with an investment of less than a billion dollars over these bonds, we would clean 50 percent of the man-made pollution to the Chesapeake Bay, of which we spend every year in appropriated funds hundreds of billions of dollars to do projects that are almost meaningless because they only are directing the money to with the, in the Chesapeake Bay itself, not to the tributaries or the, the rivers that feed the Chesapeake Bay, which the Susquehanna does. So we have an opportunity here to do something actually creative, having long-term ramifications to the economic areas of the country that suffer from coal land uh, degradation, but also not argue over the fact, you know, will it work, what should we do? Is it a tax credit or tax uh, reduction stimulus, or is it an expenditure Keynesian theory of economics? Anybody will tell you this is great economics. It's countercyclical. It's something that should be done. It can be done at little cost to the American taxpayer, to the American government, and it takes away a need and a, and a dependence on yearly appropriations that are never made. Thank you very much.
It would cost less than a billion dollars over the life of the bonds. Is that what you said? It costs a uh, billion dollars of lost revenue. Over the life of 30 years? No, each year. Each year. And oh. that will fund all of the bonds necessary to recover all of the coal lands, spoil coal lands of the United States, mm -hmm. 26 states and 126 congressional districts. Thank you. Is this in the Rangel substitute? I don't really know, Mr. Linder. I, 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 I you know. I, 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 I've not guided this in the political crossfire and artillery shells that have been flying. Um, I, I appreciate the, the gentleman's thoughtful testimony and hope his amendment's made in order. Thank you. I thank the chair. And having sat through the last two hours, I have new admiration and sympathy for the members of this committee. <laughs> this is a bipartisan amendment. And six members of this committee, I think, will find it affects their home states and will correct a massive injustice that their citizens have endured for some 17 years now. And it's also, I think, one of the most powerful jobs and growth tax cuts that could be offered to these six states. May I just interject? Yeah. Members will find this listed as Baird number four on their list. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, just by clarification. I'm speaking not only on behalf of my colleague Brian Baird, who waited almost the full two hours to be here, but on behalf of Kevin Brady, Marsha Blackburn, and many Republicans who have fought this good fight. What happened is this. There are seven states in America that have no state income tax. And they're not to be faulted for that. Those are states like Texas, Florida, Tennessee, Washington State, Nevada, South Dakota, states that have chosen as deliberate state policy not to have an income tax. Well, as we know, a state income tax is deductible on your federal income tax. But what these seven states have chosen to do is to have a state sales tax and not an income tax. But since 1986, that state sales tax is not deductible on your federal income tax. So for 17 years, the good citizens of these states, represented by some 78 House members, have been dealt an injustice. It's not fair. And every year, we're promised relief. I think it's high time that we be granted this relief. It's not in Chairman Thomas's mark. It's not in a ranking member Rangel's mark. But sooner or later, this cause of justice, I think, will prevail. I do not think that as a matter of federal policy, we should coerce states into having a state income tax. I do not think this form of double taxation is fair. Now, some of our citizens have gotten used to it, and some of our citizens have given up hope. But I would urge the members of this committee, since I rarely impose on your time, in fact, this is the first time in 13 years for me to have done so. So treat me like a cicada. Be nice to me when I come out. <laughs> and offer the House an opportunity to work its will. Because this is a matter of justice. It's a matter of jobs and growth. Now, some may say, well, the other 42 states, you're not doing anything for us. Well, the other 42 states have had the benefit of the deduction for 17 years. Now it's a chance to level the playing field, to help the people who live in these states, every man and woman who pays taxes, to get a break on what they're paying. It's a simple measure before 1986. All you have to do is look at a simple chart to find out what deduction you would be eligible for. You do not have to keep your receipts. There's no burdensome paperwork requirement. It's just a matter of fundamental tax equity. And sooner or later, we pr will prevail. This is an opportunity to allow the House to be the first in tomorrow's debate. So I ask that you make this amendment in order. Well, I thank the gentleman for his very wise and thoughtful amendment. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and being from Florida, I understand precisely what he speaks of. Um, I, I would tell the gentleman that the sorry news that I've heard him in his testimony is that uh, neither uh, the Thomas bill or the Wrangell bill has this, and 
As the gentleman may know, it's a bit of an uphill fight on a tax bill to get an amendment made. But I don't want to in any way discourage the gentleman for pushing this idea. And whether this is the right forum or not, soon there will be the right forum. I share your optimism. I thank the chair. Ms. Slaughter. Is there a dollar figure connected with this, Jim? Yes, under the current form, it would be about $20 billion over 10 years. I want to thank the, uh, the gentleman for his uh, testimony, and I do think this is the right forum. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about this, uh, this whole tax bill, um, which is going to be considered tomorrow on the floor. Uh, we're talking about it in the context of so we can get out of here by 2 o'clock in the afternoon tomorrow. Uh, and so there will probably be no amendments, maybe a substitute, uh, if that. Um, and it's really kind of frustrating that there are a lot of good ideas being presented here. I mean, we should spend a week debating this bill. You know, I mean, we, we go through weeks uh, in session here where we do nothing but rename post offices, and it seems to me that this is the kind of thing that should be discussed. Uh, and I understand where you're coming from, and yeah. Well, I couldn't agree with the gentleman more. There are tens of millions of citizens in these states who ask why we, for example, spend all day Tuesday renaming post offices, and we in all probability will not be allowed even a few minutes to discuss this matter of fundamental tax unfairness that's been plaguing us for 17 years. I think the people who live in Texas and Florida and Washington State and Tennessee and Nevada and South Dakota and states like that deserve a fair hearing, and it's been hard for us to obtain one. Now is an opportunity. It would only take an extra few minutes of the House's time tomorrow if this committee would work its will and enable this amendment to be in order. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Jasper, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. No question. Four, four. <laughs> no, I don't have any questions. I guess if you don't get your amendment, the only thing you can think about is the fact that those of you who don't pay state income tax, like those of us who do, have saved thousands of dollars over the years in not paying the tax. Mr. Chairman, if I could, if I, I just assure the gentleman from Tennessee that um, that all the members of this committee will be given an opportunity to demonstrate their support and a vote on your amendment. We can assure you that. I eagerly await right, that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cooper. Um, I think I've got um, a panel, if I'm that's the correct panel. Uh, panel of the Honorable Sheila Jackson Lee and Loretta Sanchez of California, I believe is a panel. Is that correct, ladies? You're welcome. Please come forward. We welcome you, and uh, any prepared statements you have for the record without objection are accepted for the record, and uh, we welcome your comments on your proposals or observations about H.R. 2 or any substitutes thereto. You want to go first? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and all the other distinguished members of this committee, and thank you for giving me um, the time, giving us the time, actually, and many of my colleagues who support this amendment. Uh, the, the, ability, the, the ability to present the amendment before you. I request that your committee find this amendment in order, and I further request a waiver against all points of order against this amendment. As I speak, several areas of critical infrastructure remain vulnerable to terrorist attacks. The present danger level is higher now than it was before the recent war, and neither Saddam Hussein nor his weapons of mass destruction have been found. The next attack on America could come at any time, and we cannot afford to wait any longer to shore up our homeland defenses. Due to the urgent nature of this request, we feel that the obvious way to pay for these critical projects is by delaying the dividend tax cut portion of the tax package by one year. Taking this action would generate $4 billion that will be used for homeland security purposes. We have outlined in this amendment $2.7 billion in immediate spending, and the remaining $1.3 billion from the original $4 billion generated by delaying the dividend portion of the tax cut just for one year would be put in a trust to be authorized by this Congress for additional funding of needed homeland security projects. This amendment does not ask for much money, and we get a lot in return. Four billion dollars represents only seven-tenths of one percent of the overall tax cut package. The specific items highlighted in the amendment for immediate funding amount to only one-half of one percent of the tax cut. 
With that one half of 1%, we can help safeguard millions of our citizens by completing necessary chemical plant vulnerability assessments. We can increase the National Guard civil support teams so that they're protecting the citizens of all 50 states. Provide needed physical security at federal dams and waterways all across this country. Enhance port security by funding port security grants. Increase the size of our Coast Guard. Increase the number of inspectors at our borders. Enhance the safety of our firefighters with firefighter assistance grants and grants for interoperability with police and emergency medical personnel and provide more security to our nation's food and water supplies, just to name a few items. Once again, I must highlight that we get so much for so little. As I said before, accepting this amendment and having this amendment go through on the tax bill will not disturb 99.3% of the tax bill. Surely a request that will have such a dramatic positive effect on securing our homeland while representing such a teeny tiny little fraction of this proposed tax package warrants consideration by the full House of Representatives. I thank the chairman and the distinguished members of this committee and I'm ready to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Sanchez. Ms. Jackson Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the time. And I am cognizant of the many hours that the members of the Rules Committee uh, spend uh, on their respective responsibilities. I'm delighted to join my colleague as a member of the Homeland Security Select Committee, but also, Mr. Chairman, and members of the Rules Committee to offer uh, a uh, framework uh, upon which uh, this amendment was offered. I believe in difficult times, difficult decisions have to be made. Uh, such a difficult decision was made in 1993 when uh, President Clinton and Democratic Congress uh, voted on a Budget Act of 1993, which saw the enormous boost to the economy uh, that generated uh, millions and millions of dollars, millions and millions of dollars of surplus. We did it again in 1997, and again uh, we found ourselves looking at, uh, in 2001 January, uh, a $5.6 trillion surplus. Unfortunately, we find ourselves now in a projected surplus of some $2 trillion under the present budget and as well uh, present proposed tax structure and tax bill. Having just had a hearing in my hometown on Homeland Security with over 30 witnesses uh, from the various uh, first responder departments, firefighters, police, uh, Port Authority, emergency rooms, there is no doubt that the amendment that I join uh, Congresswoman Sanchez is, is vitally needed. Funding is crucial. Uh, vulnerability is large. And I know that members who come from the state of New York realize uh, the necessity of addressing those issues promptly. We are very careful in the drafting of this amendment. It delays the dividend for one year. And I was delighted, uh, I guess maybe delighted and saddened, uh, but very glad to have Mr. Hastings of Florida put on the record I believe Mr. Buffett's comment about a number that I can't even imagine, $300 million in savings, I understand, if this tax cut goes forward, uh, that will uh, generate to him. And his very frank words of suggesting that that would not be the appropriate utilization. Here with only delaying this for one year, uh, we would be able to generate $4 billion, uh, $2.7 billion as it relates to immediate spending, and then we would have a, uh, if you will, escrow or a fund remaining. That means that the drive-by emergency room situation that many of our communities have could be stopped. It means that the lack of overtime ability for rural communities would be stopped. Uh, it means that the hazardous materials teams around the nation that don't have enough resources and enough equipment uh, to be able to provide protection for their communities would have the resources. And it means our vulnerable borders, ports, highways, freeways, et cetera, would have enhanced infrastructure protection, and it would truly add to, uh, I believe, the security of this nation. So I'd ask my colleagues to realize that in difficult times, difficult decisions are necessary to be made. This may be a difficult decision, but it is finite. It is a very small amount of money, and I believe it would be extremely important to offer it. Let me quickly move to another issue, and then I will conclude, and I appreciate uh, very much uh, the opportunity to take questions, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I offer to this committee a second amendment uh, that um, I would ask, though I've indicated the great need that we have to uh, balance uh, the 
sacrifices that are needed and that the enormous tax cut that is being proposed uh, shocks me a little bit and I would hope that the democratic substitute that would create jobs would be made in order and I hope the amendments that we are speaking to will be made in order. And I have a very succinct amendment that is a tax decrease, um, but it is important to the individuals of which it decreases it. And that is the individuals impacted and laid off by the malfeasance and criminal activity of our corporations uh, around the nation. This is an amendment, speaks specifically, I guess, if you note that I come from Houston, Texas, that addresses the 4,500 employees that were laid off right after the Enron bankruptcy. This is a simple amendment, and it simply says uh, that if you received any sort of severance pay pursuant to a company going into bankruptcy, and that company went into bankruptcy on the basis of malfeasance or criminal activity, then the mere few dollars that you obtain uh, should not be taxed. I cite only for you the story of Nathan Childs of Houston, who was laid off from Enron within 72 hours of Enron filing for bankruptcy. He and his wife had to give up their apartment. The stress of the unemployment forced them to hospitalize their oldest child. Nathan's wife, Adina, had a stroke at the young age of 29 years old. And the benefit that they ultimately got was only $13,000. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would hope that we would be in the business of decreasing the tax burden on individuals who make that mere amount of money. But more importantly, I hope that we'd be in the business of realizing that no one should benefit uh, if, in fact, uh, they, uh, when I say no one should benefit, we certainly should not have corporations benefiting from a huge tax cut that may be passed tomorrow, and then individuals who suffered were laid off uh, because of the malfeasance and criminal activities of their corporate employers uh, to uh, be able to suffer the great burden of paying taxes on meager sums. And so I asked my uh, colleagues on the Rules Committee to make a rule that would be sufficiently open for these amendments to be considered. I'm delighted to join my colleague, Congressman Sanchez, for this very, very important amendment. Thank you, Ms. Jackson Lee. Um, Ms. Sanchez, may I also confirm that you had an other amendment which has been withdrawn, is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman, it's been accepted in a different tax uh, cleanup bill that will come forward, I think, next week or the following but week. But it's so. not on HR 2. That's correct. It's not going to be on this. Thank one. you. That's just for clarification. I appreciate it. I don't have any questions, but I hope that both of these amendments are happy to have this. Thank you, Ms. Slaughter. I, too, want to just say I support both the amendments and I hope they're made in order on the, on the issue of Homeland Security. Uh, you know, as I you know, one of the big concerns is that uh, I don't think we're meeting our, our, our needs currently. Um, I was mentioning before that in my community we're laying off 20 firefighters and 20 police officers. That's happening all over the, all over the country. And uh, in addition to that, um, I think we need to – I talked to a group of doctors today who claim that in terms of medical preparedness in our communities, we're, we're doing virtually nothing. So I think anything we could do to support uh, some of these efforts would be very helpful. So I support what you're doing. Thank you, Mr. McGovern. You know, these numbers that we're using are actually generated out of the administration for most of these things. For example, Coast Guard, which we know is severely underfunded and is in dire straits right now with respect to port security. Appreciate your efforts. Mr. McGovern, if I might just add to the meetings that you have had with your constituents, one of the things that many of us have discovered when we have Homeland Security hearings, briefings rather, uh, in our communities is that they look to the Congress. They really separate out. They know there's a Homeland Security Department, uh, but they really look to the Congress because of the very um, visible role that the Congress has taken to solve their problems. And the very fact that dollars are slow in coming, uh, the understanding of how to work with the Homeland Security Department is slow in coming, I think it's imperative that we generate additional dollars to be able to solve those problems. Mr. Chairman, I don't have any questions of uh, either of our colleagues. I'm very supportive of uh, uh, the amendments that they offer and consider them to be not only constructive but creative. And as it pertains to homeland uh, uh, security, it's uh, the first of what I'm hopeful will be many measures uh, that will address it, but it certainly is a creative one, and I can't imagine that we can't find uh, uh, ways to make uh, these amendments in order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. During the August, April recess, I had a uh, meeting in my district with the uh, chiefs of police and fire chiefs and uh, public health officials who are very concerned about the inadequate funding uh, so far for Homeland Security. 
and particularly, I don't know, I was out of the room for part of your testimony. I don't know if you spoke to uh, about the issue of public health, but that is a, they are very, very concerned. Mr. Frost, if you will, um, the issue of public health is a real concern for most communities. Uh, you know, I, I have Disneyland in my district, right in the middle of my district. Um, as a private company, they have done quite a bit with respect to security. When I asked them after having toured and seen the amount of money, and it's a new cost of doing business for them, yes. uh, and they're not asking to be reimbursed for it, they asked, I asked them, where's the weak, weak, the weak link? And their answer was, we're afraid um, that there are no hospital beds in an emergency situation. Uh, these hospitals also have the problems of, for example, if there would be some sort of a biological or chemical attack as a, at a place like Disneyland or some other place, the hundreds of people who would be taken to a hospital, this is a requirement of mass decontamination, for example. Our hospitals um, do not yet have uh, the type of shower, decontamination showers we're talking about. There's, there's a real sense that we need to, in particular, in some of these large urban areas where there are many assets that are possible terrorist, um, uh, you know, threatened by terrorism, um, we need to begin to help the system. And the hospital system is a very unique and needy place today, not tomorrow. Well, I just, uh, I just hope that uh, this Congress whether it's in this bill or whether it's in subsequent bills uh, this year, adequately funds the homeland security needs of this country because these are good people that I met with, conscientious people who are very, very concerned that they don't have the resources to do the job that we have mandated that they do. If I might, Mr. Yes. Uh, Frost, uh, add to that because you had uh, a local meeting. I know that those individuals reflected local government. And we're finding that there is an enormous bill that local government is having to pay either for reimbursing what they have spent earlier or trying to rise to the occasion, particularly, for example, in areas of immunization. And I would only say that uh, I do realize uh, that in many instances, uh, issues in this Congress are partisan. Uh, frankly, we are dealing with an enormously partisan issue in Texas right now where millions of dollars are proposed to be spent on redrawing congressional lines, and it's partisan. But the one thing that I hope that we would not be partisan on is the question of homeland security. And I would like to see this amendment in this legislation. And if I might conclude, uh, since you come from uh, Texas as well and know the crisis we went through with Enron and the laying off of employees, though this is a separate issue, um, I think it is extremely important that uh, the severance pay that you know we worked so hard to get for the thousands of employees laid off uh, minimally should not be taxed if the corporation, whether it's WorldCom or Enron, anyone else, uh, got into the predicament because of a bankruptcy uh, situation based on malfeasance and criminal activity. So we're simply trying to help people overcome the partisanship on these issues, and I would hope that uh, these would generate uh, the kind of uh, support uh, that would um, bring about uh, the necessary help for our constituents on homeland security and this other issue. Well, what, if, if just for another moment, what I found from talking to the uh, local law enforcement officials was that there is an enormous cost in um, converting their computers and their communications equipment, yes. and that um, they can't talk to other departments. The police department can't talk to the fire department. The police, one police department can't talk to another police department. And that that is a pressing need. Um, and as we saw, that was, uh, that was the case in New York City yes. after yes. September 11th. Absolutely. And that has not yet been remedied uh, in many, many local communities. And um, uh, we, we've got to figure out how to come up with the money. Uh, we can't just pass the entire burden of this on to local taxpayers uh, who will then see their property taxes increased because that's the only source of revenue that <coughs> many local governments have. I thank you for bringing this to our attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would ask that this amendment be made in order and that points of order be waived. Uh, this is a very simple amendment. We've heard debate all night this evening uh, about creating jobs, and supposedly that's what this bill that we're going to take up tomorrow on the floor does, is create jobs. And uh, I think we all have a sincere desire to see that happen. We have uh, absolutely no doubt that if, if we increase in con infrastructure construction in this country, it will create jobs. This bill would create 18 million new jobs, 40,000 new jobs in every congressional district. It would fulfill a tremendous need that we have across the country. And if we're going to borrow hundreds of billions of dollars and put our children and grandchildren deeper and deeper in debt, we should at least get something for it, and we should provide them with infrastructure that gives them the ability to conduct an economy when their time comes. And having said that, Mr. Chairman, I again would ask that this bill may be made in order and the points of order be waived against it, and the House be given the opportunity to vote on it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Mr. Ross? Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing us to present our amendment. And our amendment simply uh, strikes uh, the, the new proposed tax cuts in H.R. 2 uh, and replaces them with a grant uh, to the Department of Transportation, uh, $441 billion. Uh, and this grant would be paid to the states, $1 billion for each congressional district. This is very bipartisan. Every congressional district in America will get $1 billion for transportation infrastructure projects. Uh, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, it will receive $1 billion per district. Uh, what's important about this is it's not a pork barrel project. We don't, as members, decide where the money gets spent. We leave it up to the states to decide where the greatest transportation infrastructure needs are. What's important is H.R. 2, as it's currently written, uh, will cost $550 billion and create roughly a million jobs. Our amendment, as written, uh, only costs $441 billion, $109 billion less, and creates 18 million jobs. Because you see, for every billion dollars of transportation infrastructure projects, 42,000 jobs are created. So we're talking about an amendment, uh, we're talking about legislation that will literally create 42,000 new jobs in every single congressional district in America. And in closing, if I could just say this, I'm not here uh, out of any kind of uh, partisan rhetoric or partisanship. I'm here in a bipartisan manner. You see, I was one of 28 Democrats back in 2001 who voted for President Bush's tax cut. And I believe that we should leave that tax cut alone and let it continue to be implemented as enacted. But a lot's happened since then. And now is not the time for yet another tax cut. We just passed in 2001 the largest tax cut in 20 years. $1.3 trillion. But what's happened since then? We've seen a $5.6 trillion projected surplus become a $2 trillion projected deficit. We've seen 2 million people lose their jobs. We've seen working families lose as much as 40% of the value of their 401k plan. And we have seen well over a million new people added uh, to those who do not have health insurance. Who are they? Eight out of 10 of them work for a living. Uh, we've got huge needs. Our states collectively are running a $25 billion shortfall this year. It's estimated next year's shortfall to the states will be 60 to $80 billion. So if we really want to help the states, if we want to help these working families that find themselves unemployed, then what we need to do is we need to spend $109, $109 billion less than the, this bill is now written, spends. Not $550 billion, but $441 billion and not create a million new jobs in America, but create 18 million jobs, new jobs in America. 42,000 new jobs in every single congressional district in America by putting $1 billion into transportation and infrastructure projects. And I don't have to tell the members of this committee, every one of us in our districts have much more than a billion dollars worth of highway, bridge, road, and other transportation and infrastructure needs. I'd like to tell you this is my idea, but it's not. Uh, someone by the name of President Roosevelt brought us out of the Great Depression with this kind of model. And all I ask for this committee to do is to please send this amendment to the floor, since this means 42,000 new jobs to every member of the United States House of Representatives, and since it means a billion dollars in new roads and infrastructure in every member's district, I think it's only fair and right and just 
that the 435 members of the United States Congress have an opportunity to vote on whether they want to create a million jobs with $550 billion or create 18 million jobs with $441 billion. So I respectfully request that this amendment uh, be sent to the floor so all members will have a voice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Frost. You know, I'm struck by the, uh, the testimony of these two members. Um, I was uh, back in my district a couple of years ago um, in one of the two rural counties that I represented at that time. And I went out, uh, I, was, I was out on one of the major highways. Uh, we were, there was something going on nearby at a farm and I was over at the farm and I went over to the, uh, to the highway and there was a fellow up on this big earth moving, uh, this piece of earth moving equipment. And so I uh, struck up a conversation with him and asked him how, what he was doing and uh, how he liked it. And it was real hot that day. And uh, he was working on the interstate highway, on the widening of the interstate highway in my district. And I said, you know, um, uh, this is a pretty tough work. And he says, well, Congressman, this is the only job I could get. I am awfully happy that, they, well, that I have this job. And if it weren't for this highway project, I don't know what I'd be doing. Well, there are a lot of people like that and who are perfectly willing to go out in the heat of the day and to do hard work, hard labor, uh, because uh, it puts food on the table. And I think that's exactly what the two gentlemen before us are trying to achieve. And the way you put people to work in this country is by creating jobs now, right away, not a year from now, not two or three years from now with some of these trickle-down investments, but to actually putting people to work. And that's what you're trying to do, and I, I, I hope you have the opportunity to offer your amendment. Ms. Meyer. Ms. Slaughter. Boy, I like this. Um, we learned in the early 30s that the way that you really come out of depression and hard times is to put people to work. Construction pro uh, projects and spinoffs are wonderful. 65% uh, of the bridges in my state are considered to be substandard. I would love it if we could use some of that money and have high-speed rail. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could fix up the interstate highway system and all the uh, things, build hospitals and schools. Uh, we're going to be doing that in Iraq, as you know. <laughs> And I think it might be a darn good idea if we diverted some money here and did some of that in the United States. And uh, I appreciate very much what you're doing, and I support it. I hope you get that in order. We'll do all we can to help. I, I too, want to echo my support uh, for this amendment. Um, I was on the Transportation Committee before I came onto the Rules Committee, and I appreciate the... Uh, the correlation between increased funding in uh, infrastructure and transportation projects and the creation of jobs. And we know it works. And uh, you're absolutely right that there's not a congressional district in this uh, country that is not in need, in desperate need of transportation funding. I come from a state, Massachusetts, that has bridges that are, that are older than some of the other states in this country. Uh, and they're in deep need of repair as are the roads and uh, the highway systems. and. Um, and it and 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 it's not doesn't not, not only creates jobs and helps stimulate the economy, but it also creates a climate in communities where you can create more economic development. And it's a real it's, it's a it's a it's a huge challenge. And so I I appreciate what you're trying to do. The other the other thing too is what you're doing is also recognizing that there is a shortfall in transportation funding. Those of you on the transportation committee, as you deal with the reauthorization of T21, know that there's not enough money being put on the table, and we need to find additional monies. This is one way to do it. And so I will certainly vote in this committee to try to make your amendment in order. And I thank you very, very much for, for bringing this common sense proposal to the, uh, to the committee, something that those who are watching, I think, uh, could appreciate back home. Thank you. Mr. Hastings of Florida. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm supportive of uh, the uh, uh, gentleman's proposal. And I can think of other creative distributions of, uh, of funds and in equal manner for each uh, congressional district that would be beneficial. And it's something I actually have thought about, um, a proposal to just have each member um, have at least $10 million come to their district or something. But this is great. A uh, question that I have, though, is there are 435 of us uh, and five of uh, uh, the territories, uh, and where did the one billion dollars come from? And I want to make sure that some of us share in that extra one billion. <laughs> well, I was actually trying to get an extra billion for the fourth congressional district of Arkansas. I thought that. No, no seriously. Uh, 
As, as you know, we have uh, 435 congressional districts. We have uh, five territories, the District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the United States Virgin Islands, American Samoa, and Guam. And uh, a lot of us from time to time forget, but we actually also, while they don't have a delegate, we own uh, the Northern Mariana Islands. And that's why the total is 441. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we pr proceed now and call the Honorable Brian Baird. Uh, I, we've had testimony on his statement. I don't see Brian. I think he's left. So we will assume that uh, Mr. Cooper covered his. Uh, is that all right with you, Martin? Mm -hmm. That's all right, sir. Brian wasn't here, and, but Cooper testified for him, so we can go forward. Yeah, sure. Honorable David Wu of Oregon who's patiently waited. Welcome. Mr. Wu, your uh, full testimony without objection shall be accepted for the record. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I will submit a, a written statement. Uh, as I stepped in the room today, I couldn't help but notice that there was a palpable difference in the atmosphere uh, in this committee today. And um, I, after sitting around for a while, I figured out what is causing that. You have changed the chandelier in this room. And the prior chandelier, Mr. Chairman, came to a razor's point above the witness's head. Uh, the gentleman, gentleman will yield. Actually, I guess while we were gone, the chandeliers throughout this building were changed because uh, uh, the Texas delegation, Democratic members, meet in the speaker's private dining room every Wednesday. And at, this lu at lunch this week, we noticed that that chandelier had also been changed. So it wasn't just the one in this room. The gentleman can be advised it is an economy measure, and we're getting excellent prices on them at the uh, auction block, I'm sure. Well, well uh, there, there, there may be a, a wonderful economy step here, but without that sort of Damocles They're being hang reconditioned. <laughs> hanging over the witness's head, there is not that proper atmosphere of uh, respect and even supplication uh, by the witnesses today. If you want, we'll get somebody to stand over you with a sword, <laughs> Mr. Will. <laughs> and and, and let, let me be uh, the first to confess that I, uh, uh, error on, on, on my part uh, personally that uh, I had intended to bring the same package of amendments uh, to this committee, which I brought in 2001 when the prior tax bill uh, was under consideration, and that package uh, would have included a tax cut for uh, student loans to make student loan interest fully deductible, a, a tax cut to benefit those who do not itemize their charitable contributions but um, uh, make them nonetheless so that uh, all people uh, get equal benefit from their charitable contributions. Um, it, it, it was uh, uh, my error to focus uh, almost exclusively, I think, on what I view to be the most uh, job-generating, uh, economy-growing uh, aspect of the three amendments which I brought to this committee in 2001. And that amendment that, that I bring today is a capital gains tax cut, uh, what we have uh, in our office taken to calling the 5 by 5 uh, proposal, which is for all new investments uh, held from point of purchase on for five years that uh, uh, the capital gains tax rate would be cut to 5 percent. This is, uh, this mirrors a provision which is in Chairman Thomas's bill, uh, but it what broadens the application to all uh, uh, taxpayers and uh, not just taxpayers of some income categories. Uh, this would be paid for by elimination of the dividend tax cut. And uh, let me just make two or three points with respect to dividend taxes uh, versus a capital gains tax cut. This tax cut would be, uh, in my view, far more stimulative for future economic growth. And uh, th that is what, if that is what we're trying to do, grow the economy, then cutting the capital gains tax rate is the right thing to do. And focusing our attention on capital gains uh, is the right thing to do. The second point I want to make is that in this, in the tax bill, in the chairman's mark, there is a bias between, if you will, the new economy and the old economy. Because by cutting taxes on dividends, you are in essence benefiting uh, those businesses and corporations which are uh, currently exist and currently throw off a lot of cash. 
And uh, if we want to grow new businesses, uh, I, I am still confident that uh, the new economy is the wave of the future despite current setbacks. Uh, a capital gains tax cut uh, would uh, benefit uh, uh, new businesses and new investment uh, uh, far more effectively at far lower cost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I certainly agree with you on the capital gains. So I appreciate your observation, Mr. Frost. No, I have no questions, Doc Hastings. Uh, thank you. Uh, just wonder is, is your amendment made in order in the Democrat substitute? No, it is not. Okay, thank you. Ms. Slaughter. No Ms. Myrick. Mr. McGovern. Jason. Mr. Will, for the record, the chairman of the committee has asked me to announce clearly that, in fact, the chandeliers at the direction of the architect of the Capitol are being properly refurbished by people who know how to do that because they are indeed historical um, assets of the people of the United States of America on display for them to see uh, when they've been properly refurbished. So you will be able to come back someday and sit under the pointed chandelier again. I'm, I'm happy to hear, Mr. Chairman, that the Sword of Damocles will be returning to this chamber. It will be here, and I assure you it will be safely installed so you have no fear. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Next, we call the Honorable Anthony Weiner of New York. Welcome. Sorry to keep you waiting so no, long. No, not at all. It's my pleasure. I uh, got a chance to learn about the chandelier. Let me just um, let me just say I, I, I come here with an amendment that I try to increase the odds of it being accepted by taking Republican ideas and trying to see if that might be a way to make it more palatable. R Richard Nixon had an idea about a way to deal with this issue of what is frequently complained about of unfunded mandates coming from the federal government down to states and localities but without the resources necessary. For many of our states, Medicaid is an example of that. The growing costs of Medicaid are shared by many states, and in my case, my locality. And what I, my amendment would do would to include language in the bill, if, if the amendment is accepted on the floor, to provide revenue sharing similar to that that was included in the Senate package. First, let me make the substantive argument, and then I'd like to make a, pol a political argument for you as well. All 50 states, actually that's not true, 49 states save Wyoming are facing rather dramatic um, shortfalls. Of those states, 30 have already announced intention to increase taxes. In fact, you can see this effort uh, for revenue sharing as a tax cutting measure. Otherwise, the tax the reduction that you plan to make in your package is going to be more than offset by the increase in property taxes that are being seen all around the country, the increases in state taxes, state uh, like my own, which has a Republican governor and a Republican mayor, property taxes were just increased in the magnitude of about 25 percent, sales taxes are going up about 9 percent, subway fares are up, et cetera. So what my bill would do would to provide funding in two, in two piles, 120 million pool that would go to states, 120 million that would go directly to um, localities. Um, first, I, uh, I, you know, I want to reiterate that this was an idea that was put forth by Richard Nixon to deal with what was seen as a, as a problem. And frankly, there was some concern when it was eliminated in the 80s that, you know what, maybe this money is going for wasteful government programs. No one can say that that is the case today in states, however they are governed. The funds are being used for homeland security. The funds are being used to pick up the costs that are being underfunded for No Child Left Behind or being picked up for costs of things like Medicaid. And of course, we have a problem in all of our states that we pick up the cost for the Medicare program. We have increasing numbers of seniors who are falling below the poverty line, becoming eligible for what are frankly better services under Medicaid. And the net effect of that is providing greater costs for cities and states. Let me make the political pitch now, if I could. If we wind up acceding to the Senate, uh, the Senate position and revenue sharing becomes part of the final bill, why don't we go ahead and put it in our bill now? We're constantly in a position that we're being dragged along by the senators um, in an effort to do these things which are very popular in our home states. Give us a chance to at least vote on this thing. If we choose to vote it down, uh, then that's fine. I have a feeling that we won't. There isn't, I don't think, a member of this committee who doesn't come from a state that is hit with difficult fiscal times. This is, at the end of the day, a tax reduction amendment. Because what the net will effect will be is it will stop states and localities from having to raise their taxes as much as they are. 
Is it going to completely offset their costs? Of course not. But there is no doubt in my mind that if states and localities had extra money to deal with, they would not be choosing to raise taxes. And I'd be glad to answer any questions that leap to mind. Thank you very much. Uh, I certainly agree that we are uh, challenged these days, as you have pointed out. The trust? No, 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 no. Just a quick question. Did you have a formula for dispensing these funds to the local governments? Uh, I, mean, I believe they're going to be applied for based on a certain level of, uh, of growth of unemployment, I think is the way we did it, that is included in the bill. And just for the record, Ms. Myrick, my, my former request is that points of order be waived against the amendment. That's the form of the formality of what I'm asking for. But the, the way we do it is essentially try to find states that have had unemployment increases. However, the, the effect of that is to make all states uh, all states can avail themselves of the funds. This is a national problem that's affecting virtually every state. Yeah, I think I think it's a great amendment, and um, you know, there's not a mayor in in my community, in the communities that I represent that ha that haven't in the past raised the issue of kind of bringing back revenue sharing in one form or another. And this is even before this current crisis. But uh, I'll go back to something I've been saying over and over and over again. I think you know part of what we need to be doing right now is providing as much direct assistance to our states and our cities and towns as possible. Because uh, you know what they're ending up doing is the uh, they're just passing the buck down to the you know, down to the towns, to the cities, who are being forced to raise taxes, and it's, and it's, you know, so we're not, we're not protecting the people from any kind of tax increases. We're just putting the burden on the local communities, and a lot of these important things that need to be done. I mean, that you mentioned with some of the priorities be, being given to Medicaid, public health, highway construction, child care, education. Um, I mean, all those things are very, very important, and um, and I, I, I would hope that at least your amendment would be offered so we could debate this issue. I mean, I, I'd support it. Uh, I, I think it's the right thing we should be doing. And I, I thank you, Mr. McGovern, for, for your support, although I would observe, having sat here for a while, you're a pretty soft touch for these amendments. You've been supporting many of them. Well, I, but uh, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, let, let, me, let me just say, and, and although this appears Although to, I, I oppose the underlying bill that's being brought to the... Uh, understood. Uh, let, me, let me just say, and I would make the argument, although I am asking for points of order to be waived, this is essentially a tax amendment that I'm offering because the net effect would be to reduce the amount that states and localities have to raise their own taxes. All we're doing is shifting the tax increases. And what I'm arguing is let's do it a little less yes, with this amendment. That's a good. I'm not certain whether I'm going to be a soft touch as well, so I, but I do support uh, uh, my colleague's amendment and I would like for the record to uh, speak or where he misspoke when he, you spoke of the two parts, you said 20 million and you actually meant 20 billion each. Uh, but anyway, it stands uh, 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 corrected and I just wanted to make sure now I don't feel like such a soft touch. What's, what's, what's a mul the multiplier of a thousand among friends? You know, it's... Did you have a question? Uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you, sir. Excuse me, appreciate it. No, that's why. That's what it's funny. Uh, the Honorable Rahm Emanuel of Illinois, who has patiently waited, welcome. Uh, under the circumstances, no. Thank you. You're welcome here. Your formal statement for the record will be accepted without objection, and we welcome your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the members. Is this on? Okay. Uh, okay. The amendment I'm offering deals with extending the tuition deduction that exists on the books today that was part of the 2001 tax code. And as you know, and the members here know, that that uh, tuition deduction in 03, rather 02 and 03 was $3,000 per family. Uh, in the years 04 and 05, it goes up to 4,000. And then it sunsets, it ends. And as President Bush acknowledged that he thought that the, in his State of the Union, that if a tax cut was good enough in 04, we should accelerate it. My view is if it's good enough in 04 and 05 and 03 and 02, extend it. Um, this is a deduction uh, for families to, uh, for tuition costs. As you well know, and I think all of us know, basic uh, four-year colleges have increased by an average of 10% in, uh, in the past year with increases of 20% or more in four states. Outside of the uh, Pell Grant, which we're actually in the budget going to be cutting, families are left with two decisions. They, I've made them all the time. I do office hours at grocery stores. Many families are now facing the choice of taking a second mortgage out for 
their home. Or kids are basically guaranteed when they graduate to have about fifty to sixty thousand dollars worth of debt. And in my own view, I think all of us here are the beneficiaries of higher education. At least I know I am. And it has been a great benefit to our country. And I don't think the proper choice to ask a family is either to take a second mortgage out or to guarantee that their child graduates with the, uh, the, on the, with the diploma they receive a $35,000 piece of debt. Uh, and in my own view, that there's that support in 2001 for the tuition deduction was bipartisan. So this already has history, a record. Those who voted for the 2001 cut voted for this. I'm not asking anybody to do anything new. It extends it to 2006 and 2007. I think it should go beyond. But I do think this addresses what is a very dire need where middle class families are being hit with ever increasing costs of education. In my own view, in the last 30 or 40 years, we have done a successful job in convincing middle class families about the importance of higher education to their children. And there is nothing crueler in our society than if it, having convinced them of the importance of higher education is to now pr price it out of existence and out of reach for them. And we've all benefited from it. This is not, this in fact represents less than 1% of the entire tax cut. Tax cut is somewhere around 550. This is 4.6 over the two years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manuel. I agree that uh, for reasons the cost of education has gotten out of control, and I think that we need to look as well uh, at the cost side as well as on the, uh, the pricing side. It, the, as Mr. Chairman, I absolutely agree. This is not an either or choice, but we are going to, one thing we know, costs are going up. We're going to be cutting assistance in this budget and when we do on appropriations. All I'm asking, therefore, is on the column of the tax side, we not take that away from the parents who are relying on it. Seems reasonable. Mr. Frost. It's certainly a reasonable amendment. Um, each uh, spring, um, I sponsor a series of uh, meetings uh, in my district for parents on paying for college, and uh, where, where we have people come in and discuss the various loan programs and grant programs. And, I will tell you that uh, they, these are some of the best attended uh, meetings that I ever do as a congressman because uh, the middle class parents that I represent, and that's basically what my district is, um, are very, very troubled and very concerned about the cost of sending their children to college. They, they agree with uh, basically what you've said. They bought into the concept that everyone needs a college education, but uh, it's very, very difficult for them, and we ought to be doing everything we can to help them. Thank you. Thank you. In my old family, I only educate your daughters, but I'm with grandchildren now. Yeah. I think we, we're There's nothing in here for them. I said there's nothing in here for the grandchildren, though, Louise. Oh, okay. <laughs> I only get one crack. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wonder, is this in the uh, Democrat substitute, you know, Ron? No. It is not? No. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would just say to the gentleman, as always, he's very thoughtful and he's right on target, and um, it's, it's a very good amendment. I hope he gets a chance to debate it and vote on it in the House Thank floor. Thank you. Just a point of clarification. Did you say that Pell Grants were being cut? Yes, if you look at the, as I see it, in the budget, there's going to be a cut in a college assistance. If I said Pell Grants, I apologize. I meant college yeah. assistance. Okay. I may have Stan misunderstood no, you. No, you did not. I did okay. say Pell Grants. Thank and I, the, the average Pell Grant is correct. College assistance, as in the budget. I support the gentleman's amendment. I think it's very thoughtful, Mr. Chairman. Can I say one thing, though? Please do. And I apologize. You are correct, and I stand corrected. But as Pell Grants have been held steady for the last three years, tuition has gone up on average 10 percent. So Pell Grants have not held, have been held or gone up on average with the inflation carry cost of college education. But I stand corrected with the cut comment. Thank you for the time. Actually, the, the exchanges are, are pretty interesting on this committee. And, and one of the exchanges that I was struck by was Mr. Linder and Mr. McDermott, with I think Mr. McDermott thinking that spending is the way to encourage the economy to grow, and, and Mr. Linder suggesting that uh, it's investment. And I come here to, uh, uh, to say that we can have our cake and eat it, too, with uh, my proposed amendment. Uh, 
Congress has already recognized that uh, child care is a very important thing for the future of this country, and quality child care is very important in the lives of young children. We all know that. The, the current studies all show that to be the case. Congress has recognized this by creating a child care tax credit, and my amendment would simply make that tax credit more generous and more available to more families. We've got an awful lot of families now, particularly in this kind of economy, that have two working parents. And I can tell you, in my district, a lot of folks are struggling to give adequate child care, uh, quality child care, to kids in those critical early years when they're, when the, when they're being developed. So I, I think uh, giving this uh, child an extension, an improvement to the child care tax credit not only puts money in the hands of individuals who will spend that money, and right away, uh, families, middle-income families that uh, need this kind of assistance, but in addition, it's an investment in our future by investing in these children. Uh, essentially, uh, what my amendment does is, on a progressive scale, extend the tax credit from uh, 30,000, uh, adjusted gross income of a family of $30,000 of the cap now, move it up to $60,000, and also increase the generosity of the amendment itself. It's paid for uh, by simply having the Joint Committee make an adjustment to the proposed 15 percent tax rate for uh, dividends and capital gains. And that's the extent of it. I'm not going to hold you all any longer. I, it's, it's interesting that uh, Rahm Emanuel was here talking about education just a minute ago, and he was talking at the, uh, the college level. Uh, I'm talking about education and educational opportunity and care for kids uh, at, the, at the very beginning of their lives, when it's very, very critical that we be, in, be making those kinds of investments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Marshall. Mr. Frost? I have no question. Jeff Price? I have no question. Thank you. Ms. Slaughter? No, <laughs> I, 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 and frankly, I'd stay days if it would be made in order. That. I, I too hope your amendment is made in order, uh, as as well as a whole slew of other amendments here. I mean, I think there's a lot of good ideas here, and as I said before, I mean, I think they all deserve debate and consideration. This is a this is a hugely important bill. I mean, we're trying to stimulate the economy. We're trying to help families. We're trying to create jobs. And it, it appears that this committee is poised to kind of cram everything into a very short period of time and not give people a lot to talk about or debate on, on the House floor, which I think is incredibly unfortunate. I mean, if it took a week or two weeks to do this bill and get it right, we should take the time. And you have a very good amendment, and um, certainly those of us on, on this side of the aisle believe you should have the right to, to offer it. I, actually, this uh, child care tax credit has been supported on both sides of the aisle. I think everybody recognizes how important it is. And here's an opportunity, uh, very simply, to make it more available to middle class families. I mean, Mother's Day is coming up, folks. Let's give uh, all the moms in America a Mother's Day gift. There are a lot of good bipartisan ideas uh, that have been proposed here. There's, a lot, there's some good Republican ideas that have been put forth here today that uh, I fear are not going to be able to be considered on the House floor. But we're certainly going to support your right to offer this, and um, I think it's a good idea. I support the gentleman's uh, amendment, Mr. Chairman, and an added reason why we ought to make it in order is Mr. Marshall is uh, the one member of Congress that sat through three and a half hours of his testimony. <laughs> and when you, when you have that kind of staying power, at least your amendment ought to be actively considered by us and made in order. I support it, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hayson. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Yes, sir. Marshall. The, uh, I will chair calls the Honorable Michael Michaud of, did I pronounce sorry, is it Michaud? Uh, I have his statement, which I will submit for the record. Of Maine, and without objection, his statement will be included in the record. Thank you, Mr. Frost. And that uh, completes the witness list as we understand it. Um, I am advised by uh, Chairman Dreyer that uh, we are going to be uh, taking a recess subject to the call of the chair. Um, I would also like to point out, uh, despite the uh, concerns of some that, uh, in fact, we have been here three hours and 15 minutes. We've had a very good hearing on a number of issues, as the gentleman from Massachusetts and others have pointed out. We've discussed a number of ideas, and I think that uh, the proportion of people who have testified can clearly be demonstrated to show that the minority <coughs> has had a great deal of chance to express ideas. And I would also note that uh, this has been carried on C-SPAN. So I don't feel that anybody can make a claim that they have been shut out of an opportunity to express ideas well, uh, in Mr. the process. I mean, Mr. Chairman, we would hope that... I would uh, be very happy to listen to Mr. Frost or... Mr. Chairman, we Mr. would Mr. hope that the minority would not 
be shut out in terms, totally in terms of the crafting of the rule. It's one thing to have the opportunity to talk. It's another thing to have the opportunity to influence the outcome. I, I am absolutely certain that uh, the majority's cons considerations will be influenced by the minority's comments. They always are. And it has always been so, no matter who is in the majority. Well, I would hope that uh, they will not be influenced totally in the negative. One can never predict <laughs> the wisdom of the Rules Committee. Risk is a factor of life. But I suspect we're going to stay pretty close to the patterns of history on this one, would be my guess. Mr. McGovern. I would just say to the, to the Chair that uh, you know, we, we do appreciate the ability to come and speak freely uh, in this, in this uh, committee uh, hearing setting. Uh, and, and we do appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to offer our points of view. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, this is the United States Congress. Uh, this is the greatest deliberative body in the world. We should have the right to be able to offer our amendments to the floor and to have people work in a democratic way and vote yes or no. Uh, the people who came before this committee, we heard, we heard lots and lots of testimony uh, from Republicans and Democrats, some very, very good amendments. Uh, and what, you know, what we would appreciate even more, quite frankly, is the respect that some of these amendments would have the opportunity to see the light of day on the floor and people could vote up or down on them. Thank you. Well, I, uh, I think we all understand and I appreciate the observations and I say this uh, sincerely. I, I think the reason the Rules Committee here is in partial recognition that we have some wonderful members of the United States Congress and have had over the centuries of the history of our country and democracy works extraordinarily well uh, compared to other systems for sure. It has turned out, however, there are so many good ideas that they all not can be done in a day on the floor, and therefore we have some organization. We could take a week. We, we didn't do well, very much. You know, we, you know, we, I we understand that. We have a rules committee to try and fairly apportion out how the floor is used, and that's what we shall do. I thank, uh, thank you Chairman, all. Chairman, I would only add that our concern is that none of these ideas will have the opportunity to be heard on the floor, uh, because that has been the pattern quite often in tax bills, and we would hope that would not be the pattern in this one. The gentleman is correct. The pattern in tax bills has been that generally they go forward uh, with the, uh, uh, the blessing of the committee without amendment. That is, a, that is a statement of fact. And as we know, facts are stubborn things. Uh, but we will. Isn't that true? No matter no matter what, uh, we will uh, be uh, subject to the call of the higher authority of the chair of this committee. Uh, after a brief recess. I thank you all. The House takes up their version of a tax cut bill tomorrow. Proposals include reductions in taxes on dividends from stocks and eliminating the so-called marriage penalty for people filing jointly. As always, see live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the House right here on C-SPAN, tomorrow starting at 9 a.m. Eastern. You can read